Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the uh, Millsorp World Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron, and today we're joined by Danny, Mike, and Conrad. Say hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hey, guys. What's going on? All right. Uh, today we're going to have a fun topic, I think, for everybody. Uh, but uh, first, before we do that, we have a couple of things to get out of the way. Uh, Conrad is a new member to our podcast. He's a member of our Patreon, and as a result, he gets to get on the podcast. Um, remember, you can join our Patreon for as little as $1 a month and get into our Discord. Do a good sell on how, Danny? Uh, yeah, yeah, good sell. Good sell. Good sell. Uh, and then we'll also get into our recent acquisitions. Uh, but Conrad, as we uh, tell everybody or ask everybody, uh, what got you into military surplus and what was your first military surplus firearm? So way back 2009, I was in a sophomore in college and basically I, I'd know about, you know, from Call of Duty and all that stuff at the time, like the original Call of Duty and stuff like that at the time. So, and I'd love World War II forever before that. But my buddy went to some antique store outside my college in Brockport and bought a 9130 out of a crate and <laughs> he showed it to me in his car because he couldn't bring it in the dorm obviously so i was like that's something you can just buy as like an old world war ii rifle so he said yeah and i said well let's go get another one so i drove down there and bought my first one mine was actually way more expensive than it was at the time mine at the time it was like i think i paid them 175 bucks and like most places it probably was still a hundred dollar rifle but that was my first one, and I collected Moisens for probably mm, up until around like 2017, so almost like eight or nine years. Yeah, yeah, 9130 is a gateway drug, man. It was for a lot of people. And I still, I do still have that one. I I've kept that one all these years. Oh, I don't nice. think I've shot keeping, it. In keeping the original. Five years. Starting to. You sent you sentimental like that, or just kept it because it's cheap and. I up until 2020, I'd never sold any of my rifles, so I'm pretty sentimental, I think, to be honest. <laughs> All right. Cool. What is your most recent acquisition? Uh, I got it right next to me. So it is, of course, it's a Japanese rifle. It is a Toyo Kogyo 35th series type 99 long. So it's one of the ones that's uh, same length as a 38. Um, what makes this one special is it's still got the mum, which for this particular rifle, it's kind of hard to find it on the 35th series for some reason. It is 95% um, of the value. It is 90. We'll get into we all get that. that out of the way. Yeah. We should just get that out of the way up front here. Mum is, mum is 95% of the value. And then the other maybe 4%, 5% is this original monopod. So the original oh, yeah, yeah. monopod on the original monopod on the 99 long is uh, it's pretty hard to find. They're, they're a little bit longer than the short rifle one. And you'll, that's what you'll usually see when you see these at auction is guys who threw a short rifle monopod on there. But they use a different hookup for this too. So usually you'll see them missing the, the springs. And that's a pretty good sign right there that somebody added that on later. But yeah, I got that last week, so my other one will be going up for sale at some point soon. Nice. Did uh, did you get that online? I swear I saw a 99 long rifle with the monopod. Yeah, so somebody somebody posted that on uh, Gun Broker. It was just Arasaka Type 99, uh, starting bill like 700 bucks or something like that. And nothing, he didn't know what it was. He was selling it for some guy. And um, I messaged him that night and said if he would do a buy it now. And he ended up calling me. He was in Oregon. And he ended up calling me. And we talked for a while. And he's like, well, let me figure out if I want to do a buy it now. I got to talk to the guy. And uh, I made him an offer. And the next day, he emailed me and said a bunch of other people had also wanted to do that. So he put a buy it now on there. And I just grabbed it immediately. Oh, yeah. You know, I've, I've had somebody do that uh, for me for a similar item. I talked with them. They said to buy it now. And like I went to buy it as soon as they told me and somebody else bought it before <laughs> I could get to it. Um, oh, that yeah, sucks. I was like, oh, sorry. I forgot what it was. Too. I think I blocked it out of my memory. It just hurt, hurt too bad. Out of anger. Yeah, <laughs> I, a couple 
a couple of years ago, I had a Type 38 that had like a uh, a late. It was like a late war kind of stock that had everything like all like um, chatter marked and and you don't usually see that on a 38. And I messaged the guy about to buy it now, and he said he'd add it. And uh, in the time I was talking to him, somebody put a bid on it, so then he couldn't even add it, and ended up going for a ridiculous amount of money. So <laughs> I kicked myself for that. Uh, well, um, Michael or Danny? Danny probably has a million of them, so I'll go next. Okay. Um, I actually, I have technically two, but that's because the uh, Type 99 that I bought from Conrad is literally in the same town as me and just didn't get delivered. Uh, so I don't think it technically counts until it's to your door, but <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting on that one. That one's really nice. It was... Uh, Type uh, yeah, Type ninety nine Nagoya Series Four. Um, it'll it'll the- look something like this. Yeah, <laughs> this is the one I upgraded to sell. <laughs> so I'm excited about that. But I do have two that I got recently, um, and they're also both Japanese made. So first one is a Type eighteen Murata, um, relatively. Relatively normal example. Mum's been scrubbed. Um, it has a partial cleaning rod. It's got the cleaning rod, but the tip is broken off, which is unfortunate. Um, and yeah, uh, but it's my first Murata, and I got it for really cheap. It was normally Murata's. We'll, we'll talk about this here in a little bit, but like normally you're looking around like a thousand for a Murata, and I got it for four ninety five shipped Dang. to my door. So uh, another good price. plug for the Discord. Somebody uh, somebody just posted it on proxy bid uh, on our Japanese thread and said, "Hey, I'm not bidding on this. Anybody else want it?" And uh, we all kind of watched it for a bit, and then I threw a few bids on and I picked it up. So I'm really excited because uh, it's an old older one and didn't have uh, didn't have a Murata yet. So that's the first one, and then second one. I've been hunting for a long time to try to get one at a good price, and it's a Siamese Mauser. Um, hey. I uh, I find the kind of pushback against colonialism, the history of the Siamese Mauser, fascinating. Uh, and I had the chance to buy one about a year ago at a gun show for two twenty five, and the guy had negotiated a bunch of stuff, uh, other stuff that I had bought from him too. So I bet he would have even dropped it lower than that. And I was like, oh, let me just do a lap around the show and should I should have just pulled the trigger because it was gone when I came back. And so that's just like stuck in my craw for like the last year. And so I've looked at Danny's number uh, one tip on uh, the gun show tips and tricks. Right, Danny? Yeah. Just don't walk away. Yep. So I broke I broke the rule and uh, and paid for it. So I've just been on the hunt recently. It's one of those things too, where like it's a relatively cheap gun. Like usually you see these in the four hundred ish range, pretty much. Right? Um, but for me, it's like ah oh, man, I could have had it for two twenty five. Yeah. So I don't really want to pay that much more than two twenty five. Uh, yeah. And so I just just kept passing up you know guns in the three fifty to four hundred range. Uh, but I walked into a shop and I saw it uh, mostly modern stuff, but then this was there and I was like, oh, I bet that's going to be either a crazy, stupid high price or pretty low price. And it was low. It was marked at 300. And I asked the shop owner, like, hey, have you had that for a while? It's like, yeah, I had it for a long time. And I was like, perfect. Uh, so we went back and forth and I got it for $260 out the door. That's pretty nice. So, oh, nice. Not, nice. Yeah, not bad. Um, it's got everything, uh, it's got the sliding desk cover um second contract so it's got longer tang and the one piece stock the replacement Um, stock yep yep but super interesting getting one it's it's a second contract stock but is it a second contract receiver i think so um if you open that dust cover up you can see if it's uh what's the mark out the arsenal mark i can't see it it, you'd have to tell me what it looks like i just stabbed it's a the uh does it look like an Yoshikawa. upside down does it look like an upside down question mark um i'm gonna go grab my recent acquisitions real quick no it's the it's the stacked cannonball stacked cannonball so maybe it's yep yep that's a first receiver or first contract okay. receiver yeah most of that's them, interesting when they got put into the tie stocks they replaced them with the 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 updated version gotcha 
Nice. Well, I learned uh, learned something. Yeah, because I, I saw the so so. I uh, the only reason I know all this stuff about it is I got uh, one from uh, Simpsons actually uh, that was stupid cheap. It was like three hundred dollars, and I got it delivered to me, and it is a type or uh, a um, first contract rifle, but it still has the first contract stock, which is apparently very hard to find. Um, it's not a two-piece stock. It's a one-piece stock, but it has the note, the short tangs. Uh, and then I got, ended up putting a bid on a gun broker for another one just out of fun or whatever, just thinking they wouldn't buy it. And I got it for $300. So yeah. I have a con first contract and a sunkit contract rifle. They're interesting. The The details on them are pretty good. And, well, they, and it uh, lines up perfectly with what we're talking about today, too. Yep. Exactly. And uh, they just published Bonsai, the Japanese collector group, just published a whole bunch of books on Kindle. And one of them is a book about Siamese Mausers. Oh, they, we, they finally published that one? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So pick that up because it was really helpful. Yes. For um, anybody listening, yeah. that is a very good book. Um, the, the one person that I got most of my information from is Patrick. Uh, he's a big French collector, but for some reason he's really into Siamese stuff too. Um, and, uh, he, he has a lot of inside information I've, that I've spoken to him about. Uh, he's been to the Thai arsenal. He was in the air force and he yeah. was stationed in Thailand. So he's actually been there in person to see it. He's got actual surplus ammunition that he uses to shoot with, which doesn't exist. I've never seen it, uh, outside of his collection. Yeah. Uh, and. Um, people always ask, where's the, the cleaning rod and the dust cover? Because it has a tr butt plate in the dust cover. Uh, he actually asked the Thai Arsenal. They don't know. They just disappeared. <laughs> they don't know what Gosh. happened to them. All of them have, have them missing. They're all gone. Um, it's possible they were stolen for scrap. Uh, but it, they're all missing. Uh, so the you can get a reproduction uh, cleaning rod though I don't remember where but a guy makes a reproduction one mm. um, but um, they're really neat um, and uh, really, like you said the the history of Siam and eventually Thailand uh, uh, being the only country I think in that area of Asia to not submit to a foreign power ever. I don't think, right? They, that's one of their things is that they never submitted. Uh, but yeah, even the closest to Japanese in World War II, I guess. But even then, I mean, they were still independent. Yeah. True. Yeah. I guess mainland area, I guess, would be my example there because all the other air countries in that area at one point were governed by a European country at some yep. to some degree. I think it's also fascinating that the the Siamese Mausers are Japanese uh, produced and then sold to Siam. I think that kind yeah. of export, but export from an Asian country pushing back on Western colonialism to another Asian country. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably get Western. into yeah. it when we get to it in the <laughs> yeah. We know thing. we know Japan are really big anti colonialists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, uh, we'll probably so get into me. it when we get to that point in the uh, discussion. I don't know if we'll probably talk we probably won't talk very much about the Siamese rifles themselves but right. but uh that contract allowed Japan to do something very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Danny, what uh what'd you get? Well, I was going to show uh this this is the the latest thing that I got this uh this scope which like I've been trying to get a scope for my G43 for a while. I showed it when I get that in front of the camera. It's uh it's a legit Walther mount on the it's a Walther G43, uh, and then a nice uh, cold weather ZF4 scope on it. It's got the little like uh, rubber lens piece and then the little sunshade on the front, so it kind of oh, makes man. it a little longer. But I've been wanting one of these because it just it just makes the rifle kind of pop. Yeah, it does. So that's beautiful. Uh, does that interfere with the injection ejection at all? Like it looks like that would get hit by the brass. Uh, it does. You know, I, I'm I'm guessing it it doesn't. Um, 
Because the so the if you look at like the extractor, yeah. it's kind of at this sort of angle. Okay, like it doesn't off, go up. More off to the right. So no, no, it doesn't eject up. It kind of ejects um, mm -hmm. more out to the right, um, which is why they eliminated that uh, this guide guide rail on the on the right side of the early forty threes. Um, but yeah, uh, that's the latest thing I was super happy about. Um, I was trying to find. I got a Paraguayan nineteen twenty seven, but I I don't know where I put it. Um, I was going to show that, but it's pretty. It's a you could kind of look it up what it looks like. Just a, it's a Mauser, but it's it's kind of neat. I'm going to do an episode on it eventually. But it's I, I can't find any great sources other than like what people say, like on gun boards. But it's uh, it's a Spanish made Mauser for the for the Paraguay government, and they used it in a war. And apparently so many of them blew up that they the soldiers nicknamed it the Paraguayan killer. Ooh. And so they only they only accepted the first batch of rifles and they were they turned down the next batch. They just refused to buy any more from Spain. And so all of these Paraguayan Mausers stayed in Spain and were used in the Spanish Civil War. Mm. And that's that's the yeah. one that I I've, is is it marked like MP eight or anything or you know, it has an A in, in the stock. Okay. So I've seen a few that have, because I used to collect mostly Moisins, but Spanish Civil War used Moisins, and so I, I've read about all the different stuff. I had a website on it at one point, but yeah, you seen with the, I've seen at least one of those with an MP8 mark before, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was told that A just means like a non-standard, it's like a non-standard used gun. Yeah, I'm so, pretty sure. Uh, so I got that. Those are not super common in the u.s so uh i don't know if it counts as like south america if it never went to south america uh like it was meant to but um and then i guess this is most pertinent to the uh to the episode here i've still been trying to take a picture of this uh a better picture of this for you but like this room is like a mess um oh is that the one from uh you posted a few a little bit yeah. ago a couple like a week a weeks ago yeah, yeah that's yeah. a nice that's a nice one uh yeah i saw it uh it was like a in a lot of other um arasakas but i just i do the typical like look for mums dust covers and non-sanded wood so that's sort of like the three things that i look for and um yeah the sling being on it is is kind of a a, a neat bonus and it's this is the rubberized uh mm -hmm. what is it like a rubberized canvas or something but it's just yeah so that's that's going to be on there for forever, <laughs> more yeah. or less. Yeah, it's like cemented in place pretty much, uh, however it was. But the big, the big, yours looks good. I, here's the one that came on mine. You can see it was in an attic because it is. Oh, okay. That's what yeah. they look like when they haven't been stored nice. Yours looks like it's been stored really nice. Yeah, uh, overall, it's not, it's not too bad. Um, I, sh I was showing this to a couple guys and uh, like Japanese collector types. And the first thing a guy looked at me like, oh, that shouldn't have a dust cover. And I was like, well, it matches. And he was like, oh, well, you know. Okay. Which series was it? Oh, what is it? 23rd? Can't remember. 20, yeah, because 23rd is yeah. the last one. 23rd and 25th. I, I can't remember if it goes into the 24th. I think it does, but yeah, 23rd series is is right with a dust cover. Kokura kept dust covers pretty late. Yeah, this is a Nagoya. Oh, is it Nagoya? Oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Is it? Is it? So Nagoya did zero through twelve. Is it the fifth series? Was that the one we were talking about? Maybe I don't know. Honestly, you know more about it than I do. I don't know. Fifth lot. series, it makes sense because a lot of people think the fifth series didn't come with dust covers, but they did. I think that's what it might be. Okay. I, might I remember talking about, about it, but now I do not remember what it was. Yeah, I don't have all like the symbols for the series memorized. So I just am like, okay, that's a whatever. Is it? It was matching, matching, okay. mum, dust cover. So I was like, oh, yeah. Gotta, gotta get it. So yeah, it doesn't have like a, uh, you know, it's not that um, quick release um, cleaning rod. The screw in, kind of, screw in one, screw in one. Yeah, that's that's a, if it's Nagoya, that's a fifth series then for sure. And uh, it's staked screws are staked. What does that Remember mean, that? Danny, that for the, the viewers? 
It means that they stake the screws. That's why most of your 99 screws look like they're 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 soft and staked in place. So when you try to take them out, they get they get well pretty messed up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, this one's never been taken apart. Pretty much, nice. So. Yeah, it just looks like I don't know. Like it was the sling is was tight on it when it was brought back and sat. So I mean, who knows if it's if it still has the mum? I don't. We'll get into talking about mums and why they still have mums or whatnot. But like. I don't know why it still has a mum. I, I hear it's like, oh, well, if it has the mum, then it was a it was a captured gun. But if it doesn't have the mum, then it was a surrendered gun. So it's like, ooh, well, it's a captured gun. I'm sure we'll get into that. Yeah, it's never, never fired. Only only dropped once. Well, no, for see, the record, they, they're meant before to. Before we talk about for the record, I'll say your rifle, mum intact, matching dust cover with sling. I there's some guys that will call those survivor rifles in the sense that that's something that came from an island survived. When you see them like that, more than likely you can guess that came from somewhere before the end of the war. Not always, but I, I'd put a bet on that with a rifle like that. And that was early enough to make it to, to a lot of the islands before the end of the war. If you see like something like a, a late war gun that's like that, and eh, that's a little bit more sketchy, but something that early definitely could have made it somewhere. Okay, I at the gun show today, I saw a a last ditch Nagoya that had the mum, and the guy was asking like seven hundred bucks for it. Oof. I think it was a can't remember. It's like it was two or three uh, nails in the in the butt plate, but I was like, why is it seven? Is that just like a is it worth that or is that just somebody asking because it's got the mum because that's where 90 95 percent of the value is more likely that's the case because a lot of last ditch we'll probably talk about but last ditch with mums they're still they're not up there quite yet so i'm thinking somebody just saw mama i mean depending on the series some of those late war rifles are actually kind of hard to find with a mum because so many were in japan never to be issued that most of them ended up being ground so some of those last ditch rifles like for me one of the toughest ones to find was an 11th series nagoya with a matching or uh with a mum that took me probably four or five years to find one because so many were in japan that finding one with a mum is kind of hard but obviously we'll talk about the mum stuff later yeah yeah cool what aaron you got any you get any new m95s no i haven't uh, i've been having some uh financial situations going on here uh so i've not been able to purchase anything i was hoping maybe i could pick up another one from rti with one of their sales but i don't think that's going to be a possibility um what sales they got going on well they did what have a like? uh, 150 dollar m95s uh they're b grade but but still you can't yeah. can't beat that with a stick you know what i mean uh, yeah, I still see M95s places that guys are asking like four to six hundred dollars for, and it's like, uh, yeah, uh, the M95 know, 34s, the the Bulgarian conversions are the most probably the most common in the U.S. and those and those are going between three to five typically. That's what I've been seeing people getting them at. Uh, if you can get them on the low end of that scale, you're doing pretty good. Um, it, for it to be on the high end of that scale, it'd have to be one of the ones that, so a bit, a very, very rarely you'll find one that's like perfect condition where like they took it to their arsenal, they redid it and they reblued it, gave it a new stock and everything. And it looks just, it looks wrong because it looks so nice. And, um, those typically are the high end ones, but. But those are hard to find um, because they tend to get bought up really quickly because they just look nice. Kind of looks like if you've ever seen a Polish M44 in person, mm -hmm. where you're just like, this looks wrong. It's There's something fake about this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or it's just a bolt action made after World War II, so it never got used. Yeah, so it, it's just, it just doesn't look right because of how nice it looks. Um, when those, when those show up, I get a lot of people thinking that they're, um, uh, bubbled because of how nice uh. they are. And I'm like, no, it's just a, a rare ish. I wouldn't, I hesitate to use the word rare because it doesn't make it more valuable. It's just a nicer condition, Bulgarian conversion. 
Um, but no, I haven't had anything recently. Yeah, I'm trying to be good. I probably won't buy anything else for a while until we get into a house. So the down payment's a killer. Yeah, that's no, the only reason I've bought anything is because I've been I've been upgrading stuff. So as I buy something lately, I've been selling something else. So that's the only reason I've been able to get any of this stuff. <laughs> well, I I for one am happy for your upgrades. Yeah, I, I've I've had that fourth series. I sold you. I've had that since like 2017 or 18. It's been a while, and that was one of the last ones in the Nagoya because I have. But not this wall, but the wall over there is all my Nagoya rifles, and that's one of the ones I've been looking to upgrade for a while. So when I saw that one I bought at a table at Allentown, which was kind of funny. So I went to the Allentown show um, the day we were supposed to record this originally, and it was sitting on a table, which at gun shows, or especially around me, I never see early war 99s complete with mom dust cover monopod sling. And the guy had 1300 bucks on it, which I probably would have paid. But it was really funny because the show hadn't even opened to the public yet. It was just the members. And like I held it up and was looking at it and talking to him. And he said, oh, I can do a lot better on that price. So I thought he was going to take 50 bucks off. But he took $300 off right away. So it was a thousand bucks. And I didn't even ask him to, which I was just like, so I wonder what he has in it. If right off the bat, he's going to. He's, take 300 he's bucks got off. 50 bucks in it <laughs> right. he's, I, he told me the story he got or had was he bought that from some some older guy moved out of the house that was in the attic in a, in a plastic bag which i could believe you know based on how the sling looks so he probably did have one i was about to and, talk and he, about it. it was just found in an attic somewhere so yeah it literally, this literally was and the funny thing is when he when he said the thousand he he's like uh, does that sound fair or and I probably could have talked him down more but I was like well but honestly he the didn't price know what it was fair. yeah so I'm like I'm not going to push my walk I'm just going to take this and he go had a, he had yeah. a rough idea of what it was but he didn't know for sure probably because like you said it's one of those things like you get very niche in like the accessories or the attachments and things yep. and, and you can and if you find the right person, it's worth a lot of money. But to everybody else, it's just a Type 99. <laughs> exactly. And I guarantee you that thing would have sold very quickly if I hadn't bought it. So I was glad I got in early that day. Yeah. We have a few uh, scalpers at our local shows that, like, if there's anything like that, um, they, they sort of get on it first and put it on their table and double the price or whatever. But... So I went into a show fairly recently and a guy had a whole bunch of Japanese stuff and it was all highs, you know, it's like retail kind of plus and uh, talked around and he, a, another guy, an older fellow set up at his whole collection out on this table. And that guy just bought his whole table before the show even opened. And so he's like, okay, so he just left. He didn't even yeah. like stay at the show. Cause That's it. So, at all. So at that Allentown show, one of the crazy things was, so I was there at like 8.30, it opened at 9 for the public, and there was a table that was full of like, I don't think they were RTI imports, but he had M95s, LaBelle's, uh, Carcano's, all this stuff, like yeah. not import marked in like pretty good shape. Like there was a LaBelle for like 500 bucks or something that was really nice. And like, I, I'm not interested in that stuff. I was like, that's a pretty good price for like all this stuff. And everything was really fairly priced. When I came around two hours later, it was all gone. Like literally his entire table was different inventory. And I think some dealer came by and just bought everything. Cause I, I can't imagine they'd all be gone within two hours, but yeah, every right on it, it was nuts. Yeah. Yeah. I think as prices go up too, it's starting to happen more. And some, a weird thing is, is like, uh, at some shows, dealers look at it like there's the show for some dealers isn't to sell as much as it is to buy for their inventory. And they get a little desperate for inventory, I think, and they'll buy even at like higher than uh, like what we would think they would want to get in on stuff prices. And uh, they just, you know, charge a little bit more on their website or whatever. But yeah, stuff gets stuff gets eaten up like that and I'm, I'm like growing i'm i'm having a growing disdain for certain dealers that that just ended up you know getting all the good deals like that uh before before shows but yeah that's that's a really the main way to get deals at gun shows now is to somehow 
be a member or get a table so that you can get in early that's, and find it first. Yeah. That's usually what I do. I, especially at that Allentown show, I, they were one of those only shows in my area that do um like free display tables. Cause they, they have a judging, you know, thing where you can get a table for free, yeah. do a display, set it up and you'll win something. Usually, uh, like last time, I think I won like 400 bucks for just yeah. doing a display. That's, that's pretty awesome. nice. That's pretty cool. That's like a last yeah. ditch. Right yeah. There. So it pays for my drive and hotel and stuff. And, and, um, you get in, actually you get in even before the dealers do, you get in at like 11 AM and the dealers come in at like one and, uh, basically you're all set up and then you just start walking around and you find whatever you want. So that's usually what I do. Most of the shows besides that one, I have to actually buy a table, do a display, and you know you still get in early but they don't always those ones are harder because they don't always pay off if and you know if you spend a hundred dollars on tables and then you don't even find something really worth picking up or getting any leads or anything on stuff yeah but that's that's the best way to do it in my experience yeah it's hard to start out in the hole like that but yeah i just displayed for my first time at the missouri valley show here and i want to start doing that uh, more that's pretty fun just to set up a little show and tell and yeah. get to talk to people about stuff that's and once people once people know that like especially with i've noticed just with me guys will especially even dealers will bring me stuff that's japanese related because they know i collect it and once you've done it because i've been setting up displays probably for three or four years now and just from that i've gotten so much stuff just from yeah. setting up like that some rare rivals i wouldn't have gotten otherwise because they weren't going to bring it to begin with but once they knew i was going to be there they they start bringing stuff so and it's definitely what, worth getting into that's what danny says all the time if i ask him if he's at a show if there's m95s and he says nobody brings trash to the gun show <laughs> and uh uh well, it, they, it, he's not wrong they're not worth a lot of money so people don't bring them if, if you're going to lug all that shit around it makes sense unless you're there to sell your collection you're not going to lug heavy shit in that's not going to sell for a, a decent money. So if you have exactly. limited table space. Yeah. You yeah bring he's not, it's not wrong. And, and, and M95s aren't the only one. It's just the one that I care about, but there's it, most of the time at the show is you're going to see the stuff that's considered expensive because it's, it's worth more for the dealer to bring in shit. That's going to sell than it is going to be to sit there and look pretty. So that's the unfortunate. Yeah, that. That's right. I love I love going to gun shows, but I very rarely have luck with dealers. I would much rather have just one guy selling off, you know, some random hunting rifles, a few shotguns, and then like one mill syrup on the table. That's where I've gotten most of my deals, where it's just like, yeah. oh, a matching Type 14 for $600. I'm going to buy that. Um, you, you know, it's just like where... Yeah, yeah where you just you just got to get lucky one time for one gun at one table in a show and it's totally worth the admission price it's how i recommended yeah. people go into to auctions when i tell people don't go to a gun only auction yeah. unless you're willing to not get something go to auctions <laughs> where they have like a bunch of other stuff and then maybe like 15 guns and then you're very much more likely to get stuff because you got people there that aren't buying guns and at a gun only auction they're all there to buy guns so and you'll sometimes 100%. you'll even get people that get pissed off about something else that nothing to do with you and they're like well fuck it i'm gonna get this one at least you know so i've seen that happen yeah and the nice thing with the japanese rifles especially is that because so many guys brought these home and then just left them sitting around as a souvenir for all those years and don't care about it. A lot of times when you see estate sales or auctions or stuff like that, a lot of times the one gun in it is a Japanese rifle. Yeah. <laughs> it just sat there. You're not wrong. Yeah. Yeah. They're pretty, they're pretty common to, to see, especially last ditches. Like you tend to always see one at a, at a show. Um, yeah. All right. Well, speaking uh, of the devil. Yeah. Speak yeah. of the devil. Let's transition into our actual topic for today. So, we are going to be doing a series like this. Uh, I really like the way the German series, uh, the German uh, topic we did last uh, time with Chris went. Uh, so I would like, and I talked to everybody about this, and I think everybody agreed. We're going to do a series here on Milsurp World, uh, going through um, 
I would I wouldn't say major countries, maybe just most of the well-known countries from World War One and World War Two. We might get in some more obscure countries if we can get experts. The problem is finding people that are knowledgeable about certain specific things. Uh, but so we did a deep dive into German uh, arms from the beginning of their smokeless cartridge, or not smokeless, from black powder cartridge up to the end of World War II. Uh, that was the main firearm. We didn't go into everything, obviously. Um, but uh, uh, we're going to do that again today. Uh, and we've been talking a lot about Japanese stuff. Kind of gave it away. Probably the, also the title of the video and podcast will give it away. But today we'll be talking about the Japanese uh, history of small arms from the very beginning uh, to up until the end of World War II. Uh, a lot of people probably know about World War II Japanese firearms, but I bet we get further back than that. People don't really know much about them. Uh, but I think today's discussion, we would need to do a little bit of background like we did with the German one. Uh, so, uh, to get you in the right headspace of what's going on in Japan at this time period. So, I think the first person we need to talk about is, um, uh, uh, Commodore Matthew Perry. Are you guys uh, correct about that? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think... yeah. no, you go ahead, man. You're good. I was going to say, you can back it up a little bit further, actually, I think. Japan and guns is fascinating mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of their initial adoption of firearms through Portuguese and then a little bit uh, from China um, explorers slash colonists back in like the 1500s into the early 1600s. Uh, and then firearms were used in some of the kind of feudal clan wars, and then they went away for several hundred years because Japan closed their borders expelled pretty much almost all foreigners except uh there's a couple of exceptions down in nagasaki um and therefore they they didn't have a tradition of firearms when commodore perry showed up in the uh 1850s so he was a u.s navy commodore and was tasked by the united states to sail out to japan um and then took it upon himself to essentially force open the uh the trading um portions of the country to international trade which really was colonialism um and then he returned the second time and it kicked off a whole hornet's nest of modernization in japan so the second time he came back is the part that everybody knows which is he showed up with warships in the harbor, correct? Right. He brought warships the first time, too. But um, if you look at the way Tokyo Bay is situated, there's kind of a long lead up that uh, kind of snakes through a few peninsulas. And he didn't sail up all the way the first time, um, but essentially said, you know, hey, I'm armed. I have better technology than you do. We're going to come back. And at that point, you are going to open your country to foreign trade. And essentially they did. So there was... And, uh, uh, people might be wondering why they were so concerned about it. Um, I believe that what they were looking for was a uh, basically a refueling point, correct? Like a way to resupply? Right. Um, essentially, at this point, there was a lot of economic development by Western countries in China, right? A lot of colonialism taking out valuable Chinese resources. Um, and Japan was a good stopping point on the crossover from the Pacific. Um, or on the other way, if you're going uh, around the Horn of Africa and then up through the Indian Ocean. So like the, the West was like, hey, this will make a good pit stop area. Let's 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 take a country that has no idea what's going on and just shove it in good old freedom. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think the fascinating part um, about this era in Japanese history is just the fact that that's the that's the basic storyline for a whole bunch of different countries that Western European and American uh, militaries interacted with. And then the story continues where, for, you know, first we bring in the military and then we bring in religion and then we bring in economics and then we have a colony. Uh, and Japan was not that way, where first it was kind of unfair trade agreements 
but then Japan was able to incredibly rapidly develop, um, and so they were able to push back uh, and eventually became a world power. Um, that really, if you if you really like zoom out, really the the Meiji era just clips along right to that kind of confrontation between the West that ends in World War II. Um, yeah, it's actually. If I get it or- oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dan. If yeah, I could please. interject for a second, uh, I would give a shout out to Dan Carlin, Supernova in the East uh, podcast. He does a fantastic job, like all of his podcasts, uh, but talking about the, uh, the, the that era of, uh, of Japanese sort of early introduction to the to the whole world, I think was really, really fascinating for me listening to that. So if you're interested in this, I, I recommend uh, Dan Carlin's uh, podcast on that. Too. Yeah, I was just going to say it is, I don't think people quite understand um I have a little bit more insight into this because I I do work for a Japanese company, so I do see I do interact with people from Japan quite a bit more than the average person. Um, so I I, have, I do know some more stuff about their history, but it is um, uh, quite fascinating that essentially you go from a country that, like you said, was basically a feudal peasant country uh, to a country that is taking on the United States in in about a hundred years and you're like what what the fuck <laughs> like yeah, and even yeah I mean, you or even because if you think about it it's even even less you go from the 1860s to to 1904 where they're beating the russians so like yep, almost yeah. 40 something years which is pretty that's really crazy yeah. compared to any of those other countries in the region think of not having a firearm in 1980 and today being able to take on a superpower and win. I think and right not I having think, a fire a firearm is a little bit of an oversimplification. I, I um, think that the I think nineteen hundred Japan could take on modern Russia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, yes. Yikes. Yeah, I got I we're gonna do uh, the most you know, eventually. <laughs> you know it's interesting? Russia, like modern Russia and Japan, have almost the same uh, population size, around 100 million, but their land size is just you know completely off. One relatively small island and then gigantic land mass. Same, same population. Yeah. For now, at least give it 100 years. So, uh, so Commodore Perry, and then you know the United States, and then several other powers: Great Britain, France, um, eventually Germany. Uh, kind of make inroads into Japan. In this time period, for Japan ended up having a lot of internal strife and civil war. Um, so the the Meiji Restoration is uh, a kind of really social, political, um, religious movement that happened in 1868, where the factions that had previously, a couple hundred years ago, lost out on the previous giant civil war, um, pushed to uh, remove that governing power from Tokyo at that point called Edo um, and restore the emperor to not only figurehead status but actual governmental ruling status. Is this the um, Ocean War? Yep, exactly. So that was the, the civil war that led to the Meiji Restoration. Um, and if you look at a lot of the the kind of movers and shakers for the era, they participated in one way or another as part of the Boshin War. So, for instance, we're going to now talk about uh, uh, Suniyoshi Murata, who was born in Satsuma, uh, which is a province of the southern part of Japan down in Kyushu. Um, well, before before we was, get into Murata, I, w- I real quick want to say that also, this is just how fast everything is happening here. So, we have uh, a country that is basically reopened to the West and everybody else. And then very quickly within, what are we saying? Within, within 10 years of being reopened, they have a huge civil war, right? And, and then they form a new centralized government based on the result of that civil war. And then the national founding, the founding of the national army doesn't happen until it doesn't end until 1873, according to this. So we are 20 years past when Perry is breaking into Japan 
and they still have not had a national army until 1873. So like this is like lightning speed, but also some of the stuff is slow and it's just like, um, so a lot of people might, because we've talked about Germany and it being like separate countries and everything like that. A lot of Japan is also similar in that. Like a lot of the regions don't like each other still. <laughs> and this is a result of what you were talking about, like the different factions um, that, so a lot of the regions still don't like each other. So to get a, like a centralized grouping uh, like this is, is quite, um, uh, I don't know, I would say miraculous in that time period. And um, so, like you said, though, we're talking like matchlock rifles, I think what we're talking about, right? To go to, um, now before we get into Murata, they're using, right. uh, what were they using? So um, I think this is actually a great place to pause and talk books for a second. Um, so there's a Japanese collector group called Banzai that's still um, in print and they, uh, they have a, collection of books that their various authors just published on Amazon Kindle. Um, one of those is Japanese imported arms of the early Meiji era. Um, and I think that's Francis Allen, right? Did Allen write Can't that? Remember that one is. I think that's, it is Francis Allen. That's the title for sure. Um, but this really kind of depicts all of the various Western arms that were imported into Japan during that first 10 years, 10, 20 years, while Japan didn't have a domestic produced modern firearm. And it's really interesting. It was just like fascinating collection history there or collecting history there. So they used everything. Um, so they had, uh, they had Chassepots and Gras and Snyders and Enfields, um, a few Martini Henrys, things like that. On the pistol side, they had Smith and Wessons and uh, just all over the board because you know, the West saw Japan as this opportunity for economic development and also testing new types of arms. And, and so they just flooded the country with guns. Um, and Aaron, like you were saying, there wasn't a centralized, um, standardized weapon that the army was using. And so each of these different pocket groups uh, purchased and used their own you know whatever their their ruling government got the best deal on or whatever they liked to use yeah, yeah and just um, to interject real fast it was that that Murata book i had the notes here it mentions uh 1874 they had the register basically they, the the centralized government wanted to register all the guns in the countries they could figure out what they had uh it was 180,000 uh rifles they had in the country at the time yeah and that's from what those guys are talking about. And that's from close to zero, you know, 15 years or 20 years before. Well, that's Another still, good book. That's still a tiny amount, a tiny amount compared to like a, a national army level of, of small arms. Right. Yes. Right. And, and so that's the other thing is, right, if you look at what weaponry was used here, there was a lot of close hand to hand combat. Um, a lot of swordsmanship was was still done. And that's a, a whole separate fascinating area of collecting that I'm, I'm into a bit is Japanese swords, some of which use Western style um, mountings for them. I assume a fair uh, bit of, of archery as well, right? Yes, some. I, I would say less, less, but still, but still some. Cavalry too, I'm um, assuming. Mm -hmm. Another good book for this period is called Giving Up the Gun by Noel Perrin. Um, it talks about that kind of Japan adopting firearms in the 1500s and then going away from them for a few hundred years and then adopting them again. Um, so that's a that's another good good resource. Cool. And then another one too that now we'll jump into is uh, the Japanese Murata rifles, um, 1880 to 1897 by Stanley Zelensky. It's another one of those bonsai books that's on Amazon. And it's ten dollars on Kindle, and it's awesome. It's really, really good. And I think just all of these books published in the last literally like two months is incredible because most of these were published ten years ago in very limited run copies, and so you can get one on eBay for you know two hundred bucks. Uh, now you can get all of them for you know ten bucks each. And it's a really yeah, really it's a really great resource, guys. I really recommend if you're looking at it because a lot of this stuff, like you said, was 
published once for like 250 copies and then never published again. Yep. So Murata was born in Kyushu, um, so the southern portion of Japan, um, and that was one of the two clans that pushed back and ended up restoring the Meiji Emperor to uh, ruling status. Um, so he was interested in arms development and then actually fought in the Boshin Civil War in the army from Satsuma and was an incredibly good marksman. Um, so his career continued in arms development while uh, Japan centralized their army. And then in 1875 and 76, he went over to Europe, as many uh, kind of leading Japanese did to really study what Western Europe and America had to bring to the table that Japan could emulate. And then again, kind of push back on this colonialism. So he looked at uh, arsenals and factories in Great Britain and Germany and Switzerland and France um, and studied the Beaumont and the, the Gras rifle in particular. But he advocated that Japan not just adopt uh, a foreign rifle and buy hundreds of thousands through a contract, but instead develop their own domestic uh, rifle and then produce it domestically as well. And that led to the Type 13 rifle. So that's the, the first of the Japanese-produced official domestic uh, firearms. Did you, have that, did you have that quote, Mike, about Ooh. what he said? Yeah, that was a great quote. Give me a hot second and I can find it. Um, yeah. Conrad passed me some notes here when we were going to do this show the first time around. Um, yeah, so this is... Uh, this is uh here we go okay the morale and reputation of the national army were at stake unless it used weapons made in the country itself hearing this murata finally realized the necessity of inventing japan's own guns uh, yeah domestic yeah. production is a is a pretty big deal you see it kind of repeated um through the world you know through the world and like kind of developing nations or specifically nations that are trying to like get out from under uh colonialism like uh egypt in the 50s is like an example of that that was really they were really trying to get their own domestic production and they out of desperation sort of they they cut with the got the hakeem but uh yeah i think japan is a very interesting case of like there's a there's a picture i saw of uh japanese like samurai at the pyramids of like, giza yeah because they they had it's so interesting that they had like the openness and they're, you know, cause kind of culturally and everything, not, not everybody is so open to like learning and changing. And they seemed uh, like they were open to learning and figuring out how to better themselves and, you know, educate themselves and like, I feel like ways of doing things. I feel like they were one of the few with the exception, maybe being Siam that, that saw the writing on the wall. Um, as far as how the West was treating the rest of Asia. And we're like, oh shit, we got to fix this fast. Um, and, and uh, I mean, they perhaps had the, the better resources, not necessarily just judgment, but better resources to make that happen. Um, but like you see what happened with Indochina, French Indochina, and then um, uh, Korea and China and everything like that. And I think everybody kind of just was like, okay, yeah, we don't want that to happen to us, so we'll figure out the best way to do this. And and but yeah, you do see a lot of pushback, you know, like the time period, like we were talking about, where um, a lot of people felt like it was destroying tra traditional tra tra Japanese tradition, and the J Japanese are all about tradition, all about tradition. And it, it there was a lot of pushback, and there still is a lot of pushback about what to be accepted yeah. in Japan. It seems to me that they have an interesting blend, though, of seeking technology and making things better as well as like embracing tradition. So like, you know, they're they're really like they have crazy toilets and like a lot of technology in the home. But also certain things are very traditional and you do it this way because it's the best way to way. So I, there I think it like, culturally, it seems it's, like a, it's a weird mismatch, really like blend. you said, because like dealing with a Japanese company, uh, if you're in Japan and you're dealing like with Japanese businesses, they would prefer to deliver something in person and look at something on the in hand, like a, a via like paper versus using an email. Um, they they would much rather fax something than it would be to send an email. 
Um, so, like, it's it's a weird... There's a weird dissidence between what Japan is known for, which is the high technological stuff, but, like, the way they run and live their day-to-day -day life is much, much lower technological uh, level. Um, flip phones um, are much... are very popular in Japan still, just because they're really cheap. Um, they're not touch screens, just, just flip phones. So it's just like, it's, it's a weird mixture of culture, like you said, because like, it's, it's like you said, they, they embrace the technology, but then they'd also don't in their own lives. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think too, they have, uh, there's like the opium wars going on in China. So yeah. like, I'm sure they know all about how a smaller, you know, less population, smaller country from halfway around the world was able to, you know, fight the opium wars and kind of essentially uh, control, you know, most of China and be able to get what they want. And uh, I'm sure that kind of serves as a warning of like, you know, needing to embrace technology and kind of, uh, you know, stand up for themselves. Yeah. Um, and it's yeah. like by 1894, they were the ones doing that to China. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some Somebody mentioned just how you know, it was a little bit of a controversial standpoint to embrace this kind of modernity and take on Western arms and Western military training. Um, we talked about the Boshin Civil War that preceded the Meiji Restoration, but there was a whole series of little conflicts and civil wars that happened after the Meiji Restoration. I think the most fascinating one to me is the Satsuma Rebellion. So the commanding general, Saigo Takamori, who restored the emperor in, 19, in 1868, was uh, from Satsuma, and then he eventually fell out of favor in the national government um, due to his rejecting modernity. So he returned to Satsuma and then started a rebellion, not against the emperor, but against the emperor's government. Uh, and so tying this back together, Murata, also from Satsuma, but part of the army, was a commander of a sniper unit in that war where they put down Saigo Takamori's rebellion in 1870, what is it, 6? 77 or 76. Um, and just just incredible, fascinating history. If you've seen the Tom Cruise movie, The Last Samurai, uh, yeah. that's based on the Satsuma Rebellion. It's super Hollywoody. It's got a lot of cheesiness, uh, but I love that movie because it just it gets at that time period and just the fascinating mesh and tension of not only west and east meeting together but then internally within japan just the struggle to figure out what's the next step and what's the best step for the country going forward yeah yeah and it seems that the side that kept winning was the side of you know moving moving forward with you know technological and other other advances right right so let's um, talk about the murata itself the type 13 i believe right yep yep so uh Still single shot, uh, breech loaded black powder rifle. Um, it's very similar to a Gra and Beaumont, uh, but and good against... old 11 millimeter, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is it? Uh, 11 by 50, 53. It's another one of the thousand 11 millimeter oh, 60. cartridges, 11 by 60 rimmed. Um, and so, yeah, produced uh, domestically, and it resembles the Gras and the Beaumont a lot because Murata studied those abroad, but then he made improvements to it. So, removed the bolt head. Uh, there's a V-type spring inside the bolt handle. Um, and actually, it was interesting. The book uh, on the Murata's talked a lot about the development of the spring because initially, coiled springs weren't able to be developed yet with the technology Japan had. And so they were worried about, hey, let's build a gun domestically, but then we won't be able to produce the parts. And so we'll have to go to foreign powers for the parts. Um, so they used a different, Murata used a different type of spring and came up with that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, you wouldn't think about like being able to make a spring being like the technological impediment of a yeah. infantry rifle. But yeah, that's that's neat. Um, another similar problem that they had was ammo production, where they could they could get the rifles up and going, but they couldn't. Uh, Japan wasn't able yet to get the rifle or excuse me, the ammunition going, and so they contracted with Winchester in the United States. Uh, had a subcontract for ten million rounds of the uh, of the eleven by sixty R, and then um, 
also some of the machinery, although I'm, I'm trying to remember if the machinery was for this contract or if it was a later, later, uh, the Type 22. But, but yeah, I had a partnership with Winchester. So, um, other things about the Type 13, um, they, they have mums, um, but they're often canceled or scrubbed. It's similar to some of the older Type Arasakas that you see, um, primarily because they were in Japan at the end of World War II and therefore um, had the same treatment as compared to, you know, like a bring back off the battlefield, like we talked about earlier, which actually has its mum intact. Um, and a lot smaller, a lot smaller yes. too compared to the later ones. They're tiny. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, really small. Um, uh, smaller production numbers as well. So there's about 65,000 uh, rifles produced. And they came with a sword bayonet. So the bayonet is 28 inches long. Uh, oh. has a, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty wicked. Well, that's already has a, 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 what, a six foot long rifle, five foot long rifle to begin with? Yeah, I think about five. I, I, I don't have the measurements of the rifle written down. I would but... like to see a picture of a Japanese soldier standing with the bayonet attached with the rifle beside him. Yeah. Um, oh. The, uh, the bayonets are pretty expensive, too. Um, you see them once in a while. Uh, they have a mum as well on the hooked quillion. Um, they're usually, they're like 700 to to $1,000. And, that, and that's all the different types of Murata bayonets. So if you if you find a old like at an antique store like old Japanese bayonet and it's not the later type thirty bayonet and it's not seven hundred dollars you should probably double check that it's actually a Murata bayonet and then you should buy it because it's they they get really expensive. And then and we should of, say hold on we should say when we say type and um, the the number so the number relates to mm -hmm. the year of the uh, Meiji rain right correct for during this area right yeah, yeah it gets real yeah. it gets real confusing we'll kind of touch on we'll that. touch on that when we get to it but for these yeah. marauders in particular it refers to the year of the 13th year of the meiji dynasty yep correct okay. and, and that's and similar that to weird. how uh siam does their na no, no, naming as well their naming conventions mm -hmm. And so, right, we talked about the Meiji Restoration, which happened in 1868, but the Meiji Emperor began his reign in 1867. So type 13 is 13 plus 1867 gets you to 1880 when this was developed. So, um, so it so looks like cool. looking at uh, Wikipedia, we have the regular type 13 rifle, then there was a a cavalry carbine. I'm assuming those are very hard to find, if not very rare. The yeah, the, the type sixteen. Type sixteen. There's no, there's no known examples in the U.S. and it's not an official designation. So they're really like there's debate about whether or not it actually existed. Okay. The type eighteen has um, has carbines. So we have a type eighteen, and so what's the difference between the thirteen and the eighteen? I'm assuming they're similar, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, really similar actually. So, so the 18 is the next official designation. Um, there's some differences where they have a longer tang um, and additional longer screws uh, to to tie the tang into the stock. Um, and then the the quickest way to identify a Type 18, uh, which is what I have here, I've got to have it upside down. Sorry because I don't have room on that side to point it, is these two screws right here. The Type 18 has these two screws in the stock, but a Type 13 doesn't. Um, and those two screws are on the left side of the gun to secure the bolt into the receiver. Is that a safety um, feature? Um, not so much safety as uh, equipment preservation. Mm -hmm. So Murata had... Uh, improved upon the Beaumont and the Graw by adding an extractor, but the extractor isn't internally captive in the bolt. Ah. And so you actually, that's actually a collecting piece is that if you're going to buy one of these, double check that it has the extractor because so often they take the bolt out and the extractor would fall out. And so on the Type 18, the improvement is, hey, let's make sure that the bolt doesn't come out because if the bolt comes out, then we lose the extractor and then you have to get more replacement parts. 
Just and then, chime in. One of the things with the Type 18 was I, for what and I'm not an expert on the Marathas or anything, but I know Winchester. Um, Winchester actually because they provided tooling for the Type 18, and they actually made modifications to it themselves. Um, that the Japanese didn't end up using. I don't remember what the modifications were, but they're the Japanese ended up going with the the screws on the side of the stock. But Winchester actually made their own modifications originally that the Japanese didn't end up using. Hmm. Um, another kind of zoomed in differences is the gas deflector plate on the back of the bolt is different, and then the bayonet attachment is uh, slightly different. Um, bayonet for the Type 18 uses a 23 inches long bayonet, um, so five inches shorter than the Type Much type more 13. reasonable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. big savings there. <laughs> still, still two feet. Um, and about 80,000 Type 18s were made. Um, they used the same serials, and almost all of the kanji markings on the receiver are the same, except they replaced Type 13 with Type 18. Mm -hmm. Um so you got to be on the lookout and actually knowing it can work in your favor where somebody will just see it and think, oh, that's a type 18. But you know that it's got those slightly different pieces and it's missing the screws on the side. So, oh, actually, this is a type 13. And it's a little bit more rare. Um, so pricing on type 13s and 18s are about the same. Um, they're about $1,000 on each. Um, like I said, though, uh, just be on the lookout because you can find good deals if... Uh, for whatever reason, if if people don't know what it is, or they mislabel it, or they just got it at a, a gun show or a gun store, I got mine for just under five hundred dollars to my door. It sounds like a fairly low production, uh, but it doesn't sound like they. I'm looking at the history of the usage here, um, with the exception of maybe the the first Sino-Japanese War and the yep. uh, the Russo-Japanese War. They weren't really used a huge amount. It seems like. Uh, so yeah, exactly. What condition do they usually show up in? Do they show up pretty rough? Um, I would say generally mismatched. Um, you find them; it's much more difficult to find a matched Murata than a non-matched. Probably due um, to the age. Yeah, age, and then the fact that oftentimes because this time period, right, they had some internal Japanese conflict. And then the Sino-Japanese War that you mentioned, so 1894 to 95, China and Japan had essentially a fight over the Korean Peninsula. Um, and the Murata, the 18 and the 13, were frontline along with the Type 22 um, that we'll talk about here in a minute. But other than that, it was, you know, these guns were relegated to the back and therefore, you know, they're, they're becoming school guns and trainer guns. And... Uh, show up i think oftentimes not in the best condition so i guess our and next... also right oh, sorry go ahead they're so old that replacing any parts is just a no is just a no-go right like you show up with a crack stock you're never finding a replacement stock and so it just the gun exists as broken forever i guess our next stop would be the type 22 then like you said yep yep so uh um, probably say they did do a they did do a carbine of the oh, Type yeah, 18 yeah. too. These yeah, are still, a little relevant, still just single like, shot, right? Like, so these are still single yeah. shot. Yep. Type yeah, one, of the, one, of the, one of the big things with the Type 18 carbine is um, there is no bayonet mount for it. That's a big one. Um, obviously, slightly less sight graduations. They only go to 1,300 meters. Um and it does have a safety. I think the the Type 18s do not have a safety like the long rifles, but the Type Correct. 18 carbine does have a safety. I can't remember the reason why it does, because it's the only one. The Type 22 does not. But for some reason, the 18, they added a safety to it. Yeah, I don't remember if the Type 22 carbine does, but I think it was because of its cavalry usage. Right? You're, yeah. Um, you want to be able to deploy your weapon quickly and therefore carry it loaded, but also you're jostling around on a horse, so you don't want to shoot your friends. Or shoot the horse. Or shoot the horse. <laughs> Bad day. Um, so there was there was only 10,000 of the Type 18 carbines made. So, right, 65,000 Type 13s, 
80-ish thousand type 18s and 10,018 carbines. Um, so then we move to type 22. Uh, so 1886, the Labelle and smokeless powder happens and revolutionizes uh, small arms development. So Murata uh, saw this and Japan was no different. Um, so he developed the Type 22 as a repeater, and it's a tubular magazine, kind of like a Kropacek uh, or a Labelle, um, with an eight-round capacity, and it shoots smokeless 8 by 53 Murata. Um, no safety on the regular Type 22 rifles. Um, they have a distinct look as compared to the 13 and the 18, because number one, you got the tubular magazine underneath that kind of makes it look um like a you know twice as wide a little thicker and then they have <laughs> yep yep uh thick with two c's <laughs> and then uh and then they got the checkering there's this beautiful checkering right under mm -hmm. the the handguard and the receiver um and uh, not the handguard the the stock um speaking of handguards on type 22s they originally had handguards but you almost never see one of those today so if you see a Murata with a, a Type 22 Murata with a handguard, that's a pretty hard to find feature and you should consider buying it. Um, you also see way more, I feel like I do anyway, I see way more Type 13s and 18s in the US as compared to Type 22s. Is that your all's experience? Absolutely. Yeah. What's, do you remember the production number of the 22? I don't have that handy. Uh, it's 160,000 total rifles and carbines. So about the same, just about the same. Um, but the, the serials are intermixed. So uh, there's not, a, there's not a, a known number of carbines because the serial production, um, they just, some serials were rifles, some were carbines. Um, but a lot less carbines than rifles, obviously. And then the bayonet is now shrunk down to 14.5 inches. Um, so, so see, they're much... having some shrinkage issues. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Cold in Japan. Right. It can be. Yeah, it can be. Uh, pricing on these ones. Um, so these are, because they're much more rare in the U.S., they command a much higher price. I'd say like seventeen hundred to two thousand, um, and if you get some of the the extra features, right, cleaning rod, bayonet, handguard, um, if you got the mum, things like that, you can quickly get into the um, you know upper two thousands because again, the bayonet itself is like seven fifty to to eleven hundred, twelve hundred. And they did um, do a carbine of the twenty two as well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Five round capacity on that one. No bayonet on that one either. I had to double yep. check that. I couldn't remember. <laughs> oh, and no, the the checkering on the stock is gone too, which is interesting. I think that checkering is beautiful. Is like, that similar to the, the checkering things. you'll see yeah. on the Swiss Vetterlies? Oh yeah, yeah, exactly like that, where it's it's like hatched. Yeah. Yeah, that's what always stands and, out the most to me. Yeah, the checkering. Mm-hmm. And cleaning rod in the stock for the long rifle. I don't know if it did for the carbine. I'm assuming it did. Yeah, I don't know that either. So it looks like, um, at least, I don't know if uh, if you guys can elaborate on this. I'm I I'm I'm going through Wikipedia. You guys have actual documentation and books and knowledge of stuff like this. But it looks like uh, one of the possible reasons why you don't see much of the Type 22s is that. Uh, the Philippines was trying to buy a lot. Uh, Filipino revolutionaries is what this says. And, oh, that's right. Yeah, they tried Against... to they tried to smuggle them in, uh, and there was multiple tries. Uh, they were blocked a couple of times uh, politically, and then they did get a ship through, but it got sunk in a typhoon. Yeah, yeah, uh, I've heard that. Too. So, so that could be where a lot of the Type 22s ended up potentially going to or trying to go to the Philippines. Um, at this time period in the Philippines, uh, they were not happy with American rule. <laughs> yep. uh, people, yeah. don't, yep. people don't remember that war. <laughs> you gotta have your stop in power. 1911 develop. Yeah. People don't remember oh, the, yeah, the yeah. Philippine-American war. That was a big deal. 
Um, All right. So jumping from uh, the Type 22, we go up to the... Can I jump, can I jump in with one last oh, Murata okay, note? Um, is that there's Murata shotguns um, that are... Uh, you got two types. You got some military guns were converted to smoothbore shotgun and then issued to Japanese colonists in Manchuria essentially as a like hey here's a tool that you can use on your colonial farm mm. to hunt um and then also to you know participate in border skirmishes so kind of pseudo military uh provenance and then um, because it was official government issue to official colonists there um and then also you have kind of straight stick civilian production of Murata shotguns uh, using shotguns using a Murata type action um, hmm. And so you do find those in the U.S. as well. And so if you see a something that looks borderized, it may actually be in its original configuration. It just happens to be, you know, a shotgun with a Murata action. And pricing wise, I usually see those like four hundred dollars or so. I'm Maybe assuming those don't more. use a modern shotgun shell. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Probably uh, more of a display piece than than something you can take out duck hunting. But cool though, nonetheless. Kind of like the Gehas, uh, the German. Oh yeah, yeah. Gewehr ninety eight shotguns. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks. That was a last quick note on Murata. So now we jump to a new person, right, Conrad? Yeah, we do. This is where you get the first real, and I guess really the only, if you want to get technical, Arasaka. Um. I know we can talk a little bit about that. I mean, when you hear the term Arasaka in the U.S., pretty much your first thought is 30, 38, 99, probably the 35. But if we really get down to it, um, Lieutenant Colonel Arasaka only developed the Type 30. Um, and we'll get into Nambu, obviously, later. But so by obviously by um, if we're going by the, the Meiji calendar, we're looking at... Um, 1897 now with a type 30 and that's going to development starts a little earlier but by the 1890s you've got smokeless powder um at this point the the black powder maratas are obsolete and even like the 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 type 22 at that point um is not going to cut it in the modern era so um Lieutenant Colonel Arasaka started, he was promoted to Colonel in 1895, and he started development as, um, I guess it was a, a, a commission of sorts, not like the, I don't know, I, when it comes to the German stuff, I don't know, but uh, maybe kind of like the 1888 commission rifle, because um, there's a couple folks that were involved in the development of it, with him being the main guy. But the big thing was they needed a new round, which is where we first get the 6.5 uh, caliber uh, Japanese round. So if you look historically at the time, the big countries using that, uh, Italy, Sweden, and again, I don't know much about this, U.S. Navy. You got the, the Lee Navy. Lee Navy. Small caliber, yes. Um, and that's what the Japanese ended up settling on, was that. So... The Type 30, which I've got one somewhere here. So this is where we're going to get into our first, I guess, box magazine staggered style um, setup here. So you've got basically a Mauser action that's based, um, it's based off a couple different things. So you've got the 1880 Commission rifle because you've got the non- um, you got the non-rotating bolt head, so when that goes on, like you got, it, boy, I am not good at explaining this stuff. But here's your bolt, and um, it's similar to that in the sense that once that's in there, it uh, it broke, it, it doesn't move with it. So you've got your your locking lugs here, you've got your extractor here, um, and it's got a very similar. If I can get this back in here. You've even got the similar style of bolt release right here. So that's going more into the commission rifle. Uh, it is cock on close. So you've got that based off more of a 
mile 93 and 95 if i'm right again i don't know the when it comes to the german stuff and mausers i am not an expert but that is right right the 93 and the 95 mm-hmm. we have the okay. yeah yeah the 91 93 and 95 the 95 is kind of an offshoot Cool. So, and it's got a staggered magazine, like I said. Um, well, the ninety one is a, is not a staggered magazine, like you said, though. That yeah, yes, yes, no, that's the yep ninety five. So, uh, basically, at that point, this is their first big production smokeless powder rifle. I mean, obviously, the Type twenty two also was smokeless powder, but this is the main one that um, we get into, and we've got the hook safety, which is the big one in terms of the type 30 that really makes it stand apart. I can't think of, is there any other rifle that really uses that style that you guys can think of? I, I don't know if I can. Not a yeah, whole other. That's not Japanese. Yeah. Yeah. Other than the 35, you know? Yeah. So, um, I guess what the nice thing compared to some of the other mousers is obviously one of the, the benefits is being able to, to recock it like that. If you have a, if you have a round that didn't go off or something like that, uh, it, it's pretty simple. I mean, the the design of the bolt itself, which we'll talk about when we get to the thirty, um, the thirty five, and more more the thirty eight, is just that it was not a very uh, simplified design, uh, and it is not that easy to take apart. I don't know. Have any of you guys tried yeah. to do it? Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's not. not no, I, it's yeah. not. I'm not a fan <laughs> of the. I'm not a fan of a separate bolt head uh bolts yeah it's the the thing is the funny thing is the the cleaning rod actually acts um it it has a brass tipped cleaning rod um that has a hole through the top and that's actually part of the the disassembly tool for the rifle is uh oh i believe you, you can place the i believe that's how you place the firing pin in there to give yourself the tension to push down on it to get the rest of the bolt apart but um that's interesting yeah. yeah, yeah, but that's that, that's something you only see on the Type Three. Obviously, later on, the the thirty five and the thirty eight are a lot simpler to to disassemble. But part of the disassembly is with that, with the hole through the cleaning rod on the top there. Um. So this was adopted in eighteen ninety eight. Uh, the rifle production or it was adopted eighteen ninety seven. Production started eighteen ninety eight. Uh, overall. 555,000 rifles were made and 45,000 carbines were made. Um, That's pretty heavy. Early on, yeah. And I mean, they made, I believe the last ones were, ah, boy, I can't remember off the top of my head when the last ones were made. It was was prior to the Russo-Japanese War. They stopped production before they'd adopted the 38. Um, but uh, the carbines are interesting, though, originally, and I've, I've got one of those, too. Um, uh, this uh, article says in the Wikipedia here that by 1900, most Imperial Japanese Army uh, divisions were fully equipped with the Type 30. Right. Yeah, so the Type 30 is what you'll you'll see, especially in the uh, the Russo-Japanese War. That's 100%. A lot of, like, you'll see, I've seen some pictures of guys with... Uh, the type 22s i don't really know if i've seen them with the 18s you'll see some type 22s still being used but by then the type 30 was uh, like definitely issued um the car so the the uh i forgot to mention with the rifle there it has a short hand guard same style you'll see on uh the type 38 and type uh 35 the carbine's interesting because the carbines do not have any hand guard at all they are just bare barrel up to the top there um they have a really tiny little sight it's kind of interesting how yeah it's so small how that is um uh it still has the same hook safety it does have a bayonet same kind of cleaning rod where it has a brass tip uh the interesting thing with the 30 carbines is originally and i think we talked it was a while ago i might have been even eight months ago or more but uh originally they didn't have a bayonet lug so you can find some prototypes that didn't there was one i think gray blanket was selling it on uh ebay a few months ago it was a lot longer than that but um you can find some pre-production models that actually don't have a bayonet lug at all and it was later decided to to just have it on there as an option 
Yeah. They're kind of known for putting a bayonet on everything like now. So it's yeah, surprising and, to me that they didn't have it on there. Probably because they had a sword yeah. too, but. Mm-hmm. And that was the original, that was the original idea. And you'll see that we'll talk about the 44 carbine later on. Um, but yeah, it was, it was originally, you know, you had the swords and I, I'm not an expert. Yeah, yeah. Swords. I have a type, I have a type 30. Two? Some other some other yeah. countries did similarly, like the Swedes. Originally, their carbines didn't have a bayonet lock because they have a sword. Why would they need a bayonet as well? But then when the rifle gets out of that carbine use or a cavalry use, and then it, yeah. It, it, yeah, oh, we need a bayonet yeah. attachment. Speaking, um, speaking, of, speaking of the bayonets, we should anchor here on the Type 30 bayonet. Yeah, because that's a big deal. The So... Right now, with the Type 30 bayonet, that is minus a few little oddball variations, but basically every pattern of Japanese rifle from this point till the end of World War II uses the exact same style of bayonet. Um, The Type uh, type 30 bayonet fits on the 30, it can fit on the 35, it fits on the 38, and uh, the 99s. So that band that was produced basically from 1897 all the way till 1945. And then also on machine guns as well. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. That's actually yeah. a good point. Which is so yeah. amazing. And which is another one. I don't know. Do you, again, I'm not a super expert on everything, but is there any other country that really feel the machine gun with, or a uh, light machine gun with a, a bayonet, bayonet attachment? <laughs> I don't know. I that's can't really think of one. I think I, I think I said this on the last podcast I was on when we did guns and personal finance, but that's how I got into Millsurps was uh, that old Tales of the Gun History Channel show. And they talked yep. about how the Type 30 bayonet was essentially the new samurai sword for the Japanese populace. And as a child, I just loved, you know, swords and, and that uh, that history. And so I was like, oh, wow, the Type 44 eventually. Man, it'd be cool to have one of those someday. Uh, I remember watching that as a kid, and I I rewatched it a couple years ago, and it is <laughs> it's a lot of fun lore in that oh, thing. It's so like, oh, it's, it's real so bad. bad. They basically, despite being like a whole show about you know, or a whole episode about Japanese rifles, they they dig on them hard, and yeah. they just like, they basically make the Japanese look like incompetent for going into World War II with a bolt action rifle. Yeah. Uh, against the u.s when really like uh, there weren't any countries at that point that had really fielded yeah. you know something better some uh, semi-auto rifles yeah. at that point yeah i don't think it's a dig to to say uh, oh they went into the world war ii with the bolt action it's more of a dig to say they didn't have a mass-produced like submachine gun by at least the middle of the war mm-hmm. yeah. that one yeah that's, that's and again one. when i that's a pretty wild one, to be honest. And I mean, you could go when you look at a lot of Japanese development of stuff. I mean, how about like with tanks with um, like, I mean, I know that's the, the the big meme for Japanese tanks, but like some of the stuff is just interesting what they didn't focus on, what they did focus on. I mean, if you want to break it down a lot of stuff when you're fighting China in the 1930s, do you really have uh, a push to need a, a tank? Or a heavy tank or anything like that. I mean, I yeah, guess yeah. not really. Yeah, their light tank, I think, fitted their their usage, you know. Um because you need something like small to go down streets or or yeah, on an island, a light tank is better for yeah, you know, going through trees or whatever, in between trees on an island, something like that. And um, then and I'll go into the ninety nines, obviously, once we get to the AA sites and stuff like that. Right, but right. should we jump on with the Type 30, another little interesting thing is with the uh, with the uh, magazine bolt or a uh, floor plate. You can see it's held. Oh, it's got a uh, a wire style uh, uh, spring for the follower. Oh yeah, instead of a like a flat spring. Yeah. Yep. That's and that's something you'll see on the Type 30 and the Type 35. Um, in terms of oh, and probably another big one to bring up that's a big. You know, you'll hear this talked about in in Japanese FUD lore. Is the uh, you probably won't be able to see it with my camera. I but do see the, I the, do type, see the split. Yeah, yep. The Type Thirty is where you start to see the two piece uh, stock. I so, still hear that every now and then. I still know. hear people talking about. That. <laughs> I've had I've had at least a couple of rifles I bought for pretty cheap from guys at shows that say the stock is is cracked. The, oh, it's, and, it's cracked, so I'll sell it cheap. 
I'll sell it to you. Yeah, let's not correct them. Let's let them keep <laughs> keep I, thinking that. I, no, I like absolutely. The, so I like blowing people's minds too because, like, the Lee Infield's a two piece stock. Right. Yeah. So, so it's like, yeah. Like, yeah this is like this. It's not a weird concept. <laughs> it's not. And yeah, no. so the idea, the idea behind it, and it's some. It's hard depending on the rifle you're looking at because obviously the wood, the coloration, everything. But if you look at the bottom splice, it's going to be directed instead of the wood grain going the long way like this. It does go at an angle. So yeah, yeah. the idea was to help prevent breakage of the stock, which is something yeah. I, I believe they were having issues with even prior to the time. Every, yeah, every nation ever with solid stocks runs into that same issue. And it just has to do with the grain, you know, cause you have the grain going sort of parallel with the bore at the top, right? So towards the heel, it's straight and strong, but then going down to the toe, you have that sort of issue where it wants to separate kind of between between the grain yep. and so you, uh, get, so, you so, get cracks behind the wrist on the wrist you get cracks in the butt yeah the butt area yeah it's so it's super common to see other rifles like sweet carbines for some reason a lot of them have toe damage on the stocks and that's just the thing like that happens but the japanese fix there you know dovetailing yep. the stock putting you know putting a different you know piece of wood there with a different grain orientation and then you strengthen the toe and that's one of the things I really like about Japanese like design, uh, stock design in general, is that they have that sort of tang that reinforces the wrist, which yeah. is like the weakest point of the whole stock. And then they have that, you know, the dovetailed piece to to reinforce the toe. So you have a rock solid stock, or at least as you know, rock solid as you could really get yeah. on a, a bolt action. And, the, and the, it's held in with a, a dovetail. And then obviously with the butt plate, you've got your top screw here and you've got a bomb screw here holding it firmly in place. So yeah. and that, um, uh, it was an active decision. Oh, there you sorry. Go. I was just going to say, and, and that style of carpentry uh, has a long tradition in Japan where they didn't have. Um, oh, yeah. They don't use nails in construction. They, use, yep, they didn't have yep. as many uh, as as much kind of modern machinery kind of like what we talked about and more access to to natural resources but they have a ton of timber or did have some timber and so the when you're over there i lived in japan for a couple of years and you just see all kinds of gorgeous old furniture that incorporates that same type of um you know connecting of different different grains of woods for making strong joints so yeah so that's uh, something I, yeah. I oh go ahead that's something i oh sorry that that's just something i super like about the these kind of going from the type 30 forward is just how 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 strong the uh the, the wood is and so real quick what do they typically run as far as price wise for the 30s 35 uh, the 30s and the 30 carbines so so the 30s themselves i think they're it depends on the condition so like just like with the the Marathas condition of 30s they were used probably even more than the Marathas I guess you could say in the sense that they were still in Japan being used as training rifles even up to the end of World War II well, so they had a really get into where a lot of them ended up too yes so they end up really rough um if you find a matching one of the things I guess I should bring up too with the 30s is uh they match by an assembly number so the serial number has nothing to do with anything except the serial number of the rifle. All the parts will match by a number on the bottom of the receiver once you take the rifle out of the stock. And it's not to the level of the Germans, but there are a lot of parts on that will match. Um, finding one that actually matches by that, I would say, is almost, I don't want to say impossible because it's not, but it's incredibly difficult. So when you look at a type... Like, like for me as a collector, I like rifles that match uh, even more so than one with a mum. Um, but with a Type 30, I will not own one that matches. They will. That would be a ridiculous thing. <laughs> um, so almost everyone is mismatched. Um, most are ground or defaced. I see more defaced than ground because these were sold off to other countries in an excessive number, so uh, who, which we can talk about. Big one, big one. The big one, I can even show you who the big one is because oh. the 30 I have on the wall. So this one is a Russian used one. Oh. And later Finn. Imperial so Russian. So it'll be difficult to see. 
So in World War One, the Russians were obviously desperately in need of weapons. And I think a lot of folks forget that Japan during World War One was on the side of the Allies. Uh, they didn't. I mean, there wasn't a lot of fighting going on in Asia. Obviously, there were some German colonies that the Japanese helped take over, um, especially in China. But uh, they had, by World War I, the Japanese had adopted the Type 38, which obviously we'll talk about. There were a lot of extra Type 30s laying around, so they ended up going to Russia. So there were, I, I would almost think one of the most other common calibers in Russia during World War I was uh, – Six five Japanese. I saw a stat that said mm. it was the second most common caliber, and that is the I, reason. Yeah, why, that is the reason why in uh, BF one the Russian submachine gun, the Fedorov, is in yep. is in six point five is because that's what he had access to 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 try ammunition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, and it was I mean, for especially for a. Uh, uh, a right of rifle like that, it's a good six five would be a good round for it. Much better than <laughs> much better than Rim seven six two fifty four. Yeah. But uh in my, but, in um, my <laughs> sorry, in my ammo collection I own some British made six five Japanese that was meant for uh for the Russians. Yeah, so that's another source. The British actually used type thirties and type thirty eights. The Japanese, it's kind of surprising the Japanese did sell some type thirty eights off uh during World War One. So you can find Russian used Type 38s. They're much more uncommon than the 30s, but you can find them. And they were sold to the British, too. And the British used them temporarily for, like, real second-line uses, like naval. You'll you'll see them with a lot of regimental marks, um, like, on the tang. You can find them with British marks there. I saw, uh, type, I saw Type 38 and then they, on gun boards the other yeah. day with, with British uh, regimental markings on it. Pretty cool. And the British, once they had enough Lee Enfields, they actually gave those rifles to uh, the Russians as well. So you'll see British marked, Russian used, Finnish marked Type 38s. I've seen, or uh, Type 30s. I've seen them before. That's nuts. Um, with this one, it'll be hard to see, but uh, with a slight, you can see right there is a little tag. Uh, yeah, in oh, the front part of the trigger oh, guard. The cab, yeah, the floor plate. Yeah, hold so... On. Hold, on, hold big, on a sec, hold on a sec. Big... Conrad, your, your video cut out for a second. Oh, did it? The front it part back? of the trigger guard, yeah. The front part of the trigger guard, we got that. Yeah, so, so that part right there, um, basically that is protecting the floor plate from falling out. So the Russians in cold weather obviously have a big thick glove. One of the bigger design flaws of the Type 30, 35, and the 38 is that that floor plate just pops off pretty pretty easily. Um, so the Russians first toyed with putting a little piece of metal there, and then eventually, I can't really show it, it'll be difficult, eventually they literally just milled the floor plate release off, and there's not even one in there. So this one actually has both. This has a little metal tab, and the floor plate release is just completely milled off. There's so at like, that point, fuck it, get rid of it. <laughs> it. Yeah, that's pretty much it. it. It is a big fuck it moment. Um, that's the big modification you'll see. Uh, the other one, and this will be kind of tricky to see. Uh, you can kind of make out right there. Uh, a lot of them will have a civil guard marking um, from from later on, from the 1920s. Uh, because these were used in Finland for a while. Yeah, this is according uh, to the Wikipedia these... thing. It says that most of the Type 30s ended up in Finland because uh, that's what the Imperial Russian Army was arming the Finnish with, um, and uh, as well as the Soviets, uh, the Red Finnish Army was armed with Arasakas as well. Uh, yeah. So, so the the original idea with the with the Russians using those was as also as a second line thing, but. Obviously, given the circumstances of World War One, it, it didn't always work out that way. So they did issue those also to frontline units. But the original idea was to give it to units like, you know, in, in, in Finland. Uh, that's kind of how you see, like, the Estonians armed with uh, M95 Winchesters, the ones for the contract. Like, they were they tried to give those to, to more second-line troops and well, stuff like that. This actually mentions um, that Finland eventually gave Estonia Type 30s which they eventually converted to 303 British. Yeah. Yes. I've, I've never seen, 
I mean, I, I think I've maybe I've seen one sell in the U.S., but those are exceptionally hard to find. But they did modify those. That's a, that's the one caliber conversion I can think of. That because the Russians didn't change them to uh, to seven six two fifty four. They did not do that. They just they had so much six five ammunition. But I know the Estonians did change it. We got one more caliber conversion that I know of on Type Thirties, but that's post World War Two. Yeah, uh, yeah, I know yeah. Of one, and I the, know of one. Um, According to this, well, what does this say? Oh, well, this is, I don't know how true this is, because I've never heard of this. This says that Austria-Hungary captured some, and they tried to use 6.5 Monlicker Schonauer. Mm. Those, yeah, I've seen, that did happen, because I've seen a rear sight, they... The only I, I'm not sure because there's not enough of those to have a good example or, or pool to pull from to get ideas, but uh, they did change the rear sight. The Austrians did, so there is a different style rear sight for that cartridge. Um, I've seen a picture of it, but it's it's one of those things that's just so that, you'd have to find. It's, it, there's not a lot of ways it would ever got to the U.S. It's almost like it's like a most rare that, like ar- like field arsenal conversion kind of situation where it's like, well, we, what do we have? That kind of thing. Yeah, it's like because the Austrians did a lot of. I mean, not to get off topic, but the the Austrians, like especially with Moisens, I mean, they converted a converted a bunch of those to uh, to to eight by fifty, um, which all usually didn't even envelop, <laughs> which usually didn't even involve boring out the bore at all. Just, so it, you're converted shooting converted is one way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, it's if that's because I used to be... I, I used to focus on. Uh, like World War One issued right, like captured Moisens by like Germany and Austria. I never had an eight millimeter one, but they'd mark it a certain way. So, but yeah, they did that with the type the Type Thirties too, to a small extent, I guess. It's just one of those things that there's not a lot out there to compare it to or see. There's just not a lot of examples. But um, but yeah, so that's one of the bigger, one of the other main users of the Type Thirty was Russia and Finland. Uh, so and does Finland, the, so- uh, hold on, uh, before we move on, does that have? I see a hole. Does it have the vent hole like we expect for an Arasaka to have? So yeah, it's got um, the two vent holes. Hmm. You can kind of see right there, two vent holes on the top, um, which is what they used up until the Type ninety nine. So we'll get into that, but it does have the gas relief holes there. Um, which was a big thing that they were worried about because you'll see that on all future Japanese, you know, the 30, the 35, the 99, they all have that gas relief hole there. So that was something they actively were um, focused on when developing these. So I have, Does that have a, the uh, drain, the drain hole in the stock too. So these do not type thirties do not have any drain holes or anything like that. And that, and we'll get to it obviously, but they have no kind of dust cover or anything. That's another one that, um, arises as a result of their use in the uh, Russo-Japanese war. So is the uh, dust cover becomes a factor. So there's a list here on Wikipedia of the issues that were w- with the Type 30 that was listed as why it needed to be replaced. Uh, yes. This included a poorly designed lock in which excess gunpowder tended to accumulate. Uh, mm-hmm. When that would ignite, it usually resulted in the burning of the face of the shooter. Uh, often Never good. frequent misfires, jamming, difficulty in cleaning, cartridge extracting, and in the case of a burst cartridge, uh, it did have some issues with poor gas mitigation, even with the vent holes, is what it says. Yes, so, um, they did that, and that comes when we get to the Type 35. There's some changes with the bolt and some other things that try to, like compensate for the uh the gas issues um dang that's a lot of problems <laughs> and it was so that's and it was i mean overall i've shot i haven't shot this i have another type 30 i've shot it and i mean overall the design is it's i mean it's based off a of mauser action it's it's a solid rifle it does not have it's not like where people talk about the late war Japanese rifles. I mean, it's a good quality piece. Um, but the Japanese were not happy with it to start off, uh, including the Navy. And that's what kind of gets us into the type, uh, 
the type 35 a little bit. Can we talk, can we talk trainers, type 30 trainers real quick? Yeah, that's a pretty big one. So you've got a lot of uh, guns that were um, removed from service, which is kind of Conrad, you were talking about canceled versus um, struck moms. And so you have a lot of actual rifled, still fully functional type 30s who were brought out of Japanese military service and then either sold abroad or domestically within Japan used in schools or military academies to train troops. Um, and then, like, kind of weirdly, there's about 10,000, so relatively uncommon, about 10,000 smoothbore type 30 trainers. And they've had their receiver scrubbed, so it doesn't have a mum, doesn't even look like it's been canceled at all, just doesn't have it. And then they have the kanji for blank firing ammunition only on there. Um, I have one of those that I ran into at a gun show. Uh, and I got it for like, I think $185 where just like super interesting. I'm not a big, uh, I'm not really that into trainers that much, but you don't see these very often. And I didn't have a type 30. And so I was like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to get a trainer and then I'll eventually I'll pick up an actual one with rifling. Yeah. And later with the 38s is where you start seeing, cause I don't think the Japanese, as far as I'm aware, cause I'm not a trainer expert by any means. Um, there are guys that will collect only trainer rifles, but uh, once you get to the 38s, that's where you start seeing the cast iron non-shootable trainers. Um, and we'll kind of get to that. But uh, yeah, with the Type 30s, they did bore out the bores on some of them, and it's literally just a smooth bore shooter that's marked as such. Um, but I don't believe they made any specific cast iron purpose only trainers like that. Now the um, smooth bore type thirty is going to blow up if you shoot live ammo out of them. I I don't believe so because those are based. If it's again, I'm not a trainer expert, but I believe those are based off old surplus type thirties that were scrubbed of all their markings. So technically, it is a, a regular type thirty that you could shoot. It's got a regular receiver, all that stuff, but it's just smooth bore at that point. So I mean, there's no if you shoot it, it's not going to be anything good. Okay, I've wondered because later I've seen on Type Thirty trainers, and I've always wondered because the smoothbore makes sense that the gun was like if it can't handle a live load, then like just don't make it with a rifle board. But if it can handle a live round, then like what's the purpose of it being smoothbore? And you know, I to be honest, I don't have a good answer for that because <laughs> later on the Japanese did do, and the funny thing is with like the thirty eight trainers, you'll see some with rifling. Right. Or shooting like uh, wooden blanks and stuff like that. So it gets one of the bigger common questions I see from like Facebook groups and stuff is they'll say, well, my trainer it has rifling. It's not a trainer. And with the type 38 trainers, but uh, they made them with rifling too. Not everyone is like that. Um, I'll touch a little bit on that, but because so many different companies made trainers, it wasn't just one yeah. arsenal making them. It's yeah. tons of different private companies where to the point where parts are not interchangeable. Uh, you'll get guys asking, how can I restore this trainer that's missing a bowl or missing a stock? And literally, it's a guessing game. You, you, you could buy a stock online, but maybe it's going to fit. Maybe it's not. So yeah. with the train stuff, it's just very it, it can get kind of complicated like that. Yeah. yeah, trainers seem like a rabbit hole. I know a lot, it seems like when I hear people that want to buy a trainer, it's specifically to get the stock off of the trainer. Uh, which, will not, yeah. which will not even work because the trainers, almost every trainer for a Type 38 uses um, a shorter style tang. It's very different. So like you wouldn't even be able to fit a normal uh, 38 action into a trainer stock. Now, later on, I don't have an example. We'll talk maybe a little bit about it when I talk about the 35s. But um, at the end of the war, the Japanese put together some last ditch kind of things that use type 35 actions with all training rifle stocks and, and stuff I like that. I think Danny has one of those, don't you, Danny? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, O2. Yeah, it O2 doesn't, yeah, it doesn't have an official Japanese name. Basically, it's a collector name. So we call it the O245 for made in 1902, the main action, and then 45 when they were put together. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I like calling it a Type 35 last ditch. Yeah. Yeah. 
I call it a Titan but, um, 245. So before, yeah, so I mean, when it comes on. to the Type... Hold on, are, oh. we, are we good with a Type 30? A Type 30, I mean? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I think I think that covers pretty much everything. Most of the stuff with a 30. So um, that's the, wise, we probably should move along. <laughs> okay, we, I'm sorry. It is going to take a while, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, so No, so, I... It was uh, I was doing the math on like how many models we had, and I was like, "Oh, this is gonna, this puppy's going to be like well, three hours." Well, long. we're just going to probably have to skim through some of this. So, uh, so the Type Thirty is the first and only Arasaka. Uh, this is the only Congrats. one that Arasaka designed himself, invented himself, and then we move to the Type Thirty Five. Now, who was the Type Thirty Five for? So the Type 35 was for the Navy. Um, the Navy had, based on the use, like the 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 reports of the Type 30 in the Russo-Japanese War, which it was heavily used in, there were a couple things with that, and then just the overall design of the Type 30 um, had some problems. So that's where we start getting the Navy looking into some other act uh, options, and that's where we also see. Um, Captain Nambu come in. Yes. So originally he helped design the type 30 muzzle cover, which is the kind that kind of, um, it's got like that, uh, sliding thing that kind of goes over the rear sight. Oh uh, yeah. Um, it's a little different than like the, the later, like type 38 type 99 muzzle covers you'll see, but he originally was tasked with designing that. um, and when it comes to the Type 35, it was more of the Navy trying to find some better solutions for some of the problems that the Type 30 had. Uh, there's some similarities, and then there's some really weird stuff. So when you're looking at it from, from here down, it looks pretty normal. And then you get to this big old difference here. So yeah, what is that funky the Type 35 is the... A little bigger yeah. in the rear sight there. Yep, and then growth. we've got a little bit of a difference with this, where we've got our first dust cover, and the the bolt itself is a little different, and then the rest pretty much the same. So the rear sight, it might ring a bell to some of you guys, but it's the only Japanese rifle from this time period, or uh, I think it's the only Japanese rifle that uses a tangent style sight like this. Um, everything else is t typically a ladder style. Uh, the handguard has that distinct uh, Dutch look to it, I guess you could say. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Um, so it's, uh, what was it, 1895 Monlicker style, mm. if I'm correct? Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, same length as a Type 30, so it's 31 inch. I, I don't think I said that earlier. So it's basically 50 inch long, uh, 31 inch barrel. Uh, so that part's all the same. Rear sight, you've got a tangent rear sight. Uh, the bolt is a little bit different. So the, the action itself um, is, a, you know, same kind of deal. It's got that kind of 1888 style safe or uh, bolt release. So the bolt itself, if it'll come out. So the main part of it is exactly the same in terms of the the extractor and the bolt head and all that stuff for the most part. Um, there is a lip on the bolt now, which the Type 30 did not have, which I believe is to help with um, seating the round a little bit better. That was kind of an issue with feeding on the Type 30. Uh, and I believe, let me pull this out. The follower itself is a little bit different. It's a little beefier, if I remember right. Again, to kind of help with feeding, it still uses the, uh, that like spring style, uh, yeah, the wire spring, yeah, follower spring. spring. Yep. Uh, the other big difference is this style of safety. So it's still hook ish. Um, but honestly, part of this is to help with gas blowing back. It's a bit a bit bigger of a design um, to kind of help with that. Uh, what else was different with this? The bolt handle itself is a little different, too. I, I don't have it right here, but 
Uh, it's more of that classic plum shape you're going to see on the Type 38 and the Type 99. The the bull on the uh, the Type 30 is much more of like a, a ball shape than this like kind of plum style. So um, reading the stuff here, it looks like now now for those that have listened to our podcast in the past and those that are understanding this, um, he said that this was made for the Japanese Navy. Now, unlike Similar to the U.S. and and other countries too is that the the different branches of the military kind of follow their own procurement path of of arms and arsenals. Uh, typically, they're obviously trying to be somewhat similar to the uh, different branches, but uh, somewhat unique to Japan is that the navy and the army just straight up hate each other uh, to the point where at some times they're actively trying to sabotage each other in a war uh during the war yes uh so it's 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 actually we could probably do a whole podcast just about all the stupid petty bullshit they took the two of them got up to each other yeah because they um, the army and the navy both had planes and ships yeah it it's just this is the basically this this right here is the start of the petty bullshit and um, uh, so, so the reason I don't know if you if this is listed in the books. According to Wikipedia here, uh, part of the reason why they decided to to replace the Type Thirty because they didn't like the Type Thirty because they had seen the results of its use in the in the in the uh, the Russian uh, war, so they didn't want really want the Type Thirty. But the reason they they did the Type Thirty Five is because the Tokyo Arsenal decided they were going to stop making the Murata cartridge. Yeah, because they were still like, using the Type 20. Just like, fuck we're you, we're not doing this shit back. anymore. <laughs> and that's part of the problem, is that the arsenals themselves were were army-controlled Yes, through through the end of World War II. Yeah, so basically... Uh, the main ones, is, especially... At I think this is definitely the start of the petty bullshit. Uh, definitely. Yeah, and, and one of the other things that I didn't, I didn't mention earlier is that from all this time, from your, your Type 13 till now, and through the 38... There is only one arsenal in Japan making these small arms. There is no no other arsenal in the country is doing yeah. it. Uh, everything is being made at the Tokyo Artillery Arsenal, um, which is going to come to play here in a little bit with the Type 38. But prior to um, the 1920s, basically, that was the only source you were getting the small arms production in Japan from. So the Navy would also have to get their rifles from that same arsenal, that was making rifles for the army. Um, the other big thing with the Type 35 is obviously the dust cover, which becomes a central thing with Japanese firearms after that. Uh, the big difference is this dust cover does not move with the bolt. So uh, basically you have to lift this little spring here and move it forward. Now that and at that point familiar. you're here. Yes, it does. Uh, um, and this will actually, this particular rifle, this particular rifle links back to that. So, um, yeah, the dust cover is does not move with the bolt. It is kind of a downside because if you are in the middle of about to go to combat and you fire your first round and have not moved this dust cover, you are in trouble <laughs> when you try the chamber another round. And it was something that Nambu himself was never happy with, with how it turned out. Uh, he did not like that. They, they wanted the cover. If you look at pictures of Japanese soldiers in the Russo-Japanese War, you will see Type 30s with big wrapped around like canvas and stuff around their actions. So it definitely was something that they actively wanted to resolve as a with a rifle design. Now that that's so because this the area that they were fighting in was mostly tundra plains, right? So there was a lot of dust. Yeah, Manchur yeah. you're you're in Man you're in Manchuria, uh a little bit in Korea, but most of this was in Manchuria in that area. So it completely makes sense. With uh, and it does have um, oh, yeah, trench warfare. It does have holes. Yeah. And it does have holes in the dust cover for your gas relief, so they line up um perfectly. Oh, in that there. would suck. Um, that would really suck. <laughs> you have to have no relief when you when it does fail exactly. Um one of the big things when buying Type 35s, which, I mean, you, there's not a lot of chances to buy Type 35s. When you run into them every week, you know. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> people do replace Type 35 dust covers with um, the Siamese ones, because obviously those are a lot more prevalent, but they do not, they're not completely interchangeable. They're slightly different. And they don't have uh, the holes. Um, I didn't know that. That's exactly. Interesting. That's sneaky. So they don't have the holes. So a lot of times guys will drill the holes into the, the Siamese ones. And they're a little bit, I, I can't remember if they're shorter or longer. It's one way or the other, but basically they don't line up perfectly. So you have to kind of modify it to make it work. Um, have you had, what the was about, what's that? Have, you had have you had the chance to buy, I guess not just like gun broker. Cause it's technically everybody has a chance to buy it, but have you had the chance to buy more than one in person? Like, have you seen, I've never seen one for this is the this is the only one that I've ever had the chance to buy. Um, I've never seen another one at a show. Um, I definitely wouldn't expect to run into it a small Besides show. Besides that the one you've shown me just now is the one that I saw that Danny got. That everybody was super excited about when he posted a picture of it. Um, the the, yeah, the yeah. O245, which was mm -hmm. basically made at the very end of the war of World War II with whatever the fuck they had on hand yeah so so what's interesting about the o245s is they're not exactly like a, a, a type 35 receiver just taken like this one off of a rifle they're based from a a sub caliber training thing that the japanese navy used so those receivers don't actually have there's no serial number in it um a lot of them don't have dust cover like it's not like a groove like the type 35 uh the Type 38s, they have like a rail that the dust cover lines into, but the O245s don't have that rail in it. So basically, it was a, a Type 35 action strapped to this contraption to help train naval gunners um, without using, obviously, a giant, you know, right. the Howard huge naval gun. Um, at the end of the war, obviously, those were pretty useless because the Japanese Navy was nearly non-existent. So they took those barreled actions and turned them into a, into an O two forty five like that. Yeah, so they're they're really they're beautiful. They're just wonky. So uh, I'm I'm gonna stab my ceiling if I try to spin it around. But upside down, yeah, no cereal. Get mine too. Uh, no cereal. Mine has the one where the barrel looks normal. You can get some of the the. Conrad was talking about the Hiro Hiroki Hiroku. Yeah, the, yeah, Hiroki. Um, That's what it says. The, in the yeah, the the naval training, naval gun training device. Yeah. You get them with the uh, the barrel shank here looks like weird, like almost like grooved. Um, speaking of no no grooves for a dust cover on these ones, and then the stock is so weird. I don't know if you can see it on the camera angle, but do you see how the wood on mine is just warped? Like, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's oh, really... So, like, oh, shit, it's like... Those are made with basically really bad training rifle stocks. Like, they're one, they're typically one-piece stocks like a training rifle would be, and they're force-fitted to fit that rifle, that action into it. Like, yeah. that front band, that's a training rifle part. Um, the rear sight on it is also from a training rifle. You can actually, if you look, you can compare an O two forty five adjustable sight um, to a training rifle. A certain, I forget which one it is, but yeah, there. Most of the parts on those, besides the action, the bolt, um, even the uh, even the floor plate and, and the the trigger guard and everything, that's all training rifle parts. Yeah, yeah, my yeah, the trigger guard definitely looks like a like a training rifle my yeah does yours have a rear aperture no uh, it does yes yeah. michael yeah okay so that's pretty there standard. Are like some, there's a few that do use a fixed rear sight too those are more uncommon um but they do have some that use a fixed sight like a last ditch rifle so there's a little gap here between the top handguard and the stock and you could kind of wiggle it back and forth a little bit and this rear uh barrel band here if I kind of put it flat here, you can see it's kind of it's, it's canted. It doesn't fit straight on it, and it just it won't if it needs to fit behind the barrel band. Are, are either of your guys? Do they have nails holding it in the handguard in near the rear sight? Uh, mine does. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. They'll, yeah. They have two nails that kind of hold it in, so it doesn't really latch into the rear sight base at all. So it's like a training rifle, just like that, because that's how a lot of the training rifles are too. 
This is uh this is probably my favorite pickup that I've ever gotten. Uh, for sure, Japanese. Um, I got it from a guy selling his oh, dad's. Dang. Is this a machine? Yeah, program. look at that. That's yeah, that's a hundred percent right there too. That's that's funny. Look at the difference between ours. Mine is like inset into the wood and has a nail, not a nail, a screw that's just like poking up just a little bit. And Danny, yours is the opposite, where your your butt plate yep. is is sticking I've out. Got an Annie and an Audi. <laughs> And that's how they were, because these were made. They were made by um, one particular uh, training rifle arsenal. And they were Navy made. Uh, it was in Os Osaka. It was Izawa. Yeah, this who one also made. Some it says it's thought to be, but it's never been officially confirmed. All of this is just based Most, on. One of the interesting things is Izawa is one of the only Type ninety nine makers that uses a front band with one screw in it. Uh, and those also typically use that kind of style where the front band only has one screw. Um, Danny, and there's a few yeah. other little markings and stuff. Danny, I need to, uh, to be, be right back. Uh, but, okay. um, you guys can continue and, yeah, yeah. um, uh, you can finish up with a 35 and then we can go to the 38. Okie dokie. All right. Yeah. 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 But so when it comes to the 35, uh, total production was only 38,000 made. So a lot of them ended up going, and I say a lot, most of the, a lot of the ones you'll see in the country ended up going to, uh, to, to Thailand. Um, when the Japanese were trying to sell the rifle design to the, the Siamese, uh, they, they sent them type thirties, 38s, 35s, and they ended up going with a design kind of based off well with the dust cover for the for the Siamese Mausers, but completely different action. Obviously, they did not use the Type 35 action. Um, but the Siamese kept these in their arsenals through the 1960s, and it's one of the best sources to find a Type 35. Most of them that were there are in I mean, this one's not in perfect condition, but they're they're very good uh, overall. Like this one's about as original as you can get. In terms of finish quality, they'll have a small. Um, it'll de you definitely won't see it, but they have a small chakra right there, uh, which most of these ones were property marked with, um, and they got sold off in the '60s. So that that's this is what this one was, which is pretty. Uh, yeah, it's pretty typical for these. The other way you can find them, there's a few that are finish marked. Um, those are very uncommon. I know a few. Maybe a year or so ago, somebody on gun boards in Finland posted one he found in an attic uh, uh -huh. with, an, with an 1895 Winchester, I think, uh, which is oh, pretty cool. Uh, yeah, that's sweet. So he found that. But other than that, there's not a lot like they just a lot were sold off and a lot were used as training rifles, too. So um, one of the interesting things about the 0245s especially is that I've never seen one with a ground mum. Yeah, it's very weird. Yeah, uh, yeah I was going to ask about that because yeah, this one doesn't, and I was really surprised because I was like, yeah, this one definitely was, you know, captured never. Somewhere. Oh, hundred percent. And it's just for some reason, every one of them has an intact mom. I mean, obviously, I can't say everyone, but everyone that I've run across, I've never seen a ground one, which makes me think they just happen to be somewhere in Japan at the end of the war, where just. Either they were found really late in the occupation to the point where they weren't grinding rifles as religiously as before that, like right when the occupation started, or they were just somewhere that, you know, they didn't have access to do that for some reason. But it's really weird how almost every one of them has an intact mum. Um, it's kind of interesting that the Siamese ones, marked ones, also have an intact mum, because typically when the Japanese would sell a rifle to another country, you would have to deface the mum. Oh, yeah. Uh, as part of it, but every Siamese marked 35 I've seen, they also have an intact mom, which is kind of really odd. Yeah. Like most of the ones that went to Russia will have the, uh, the Tokyo arsenal stamp, the, uh, stack cannonballs over the mom. Um, but none of these Siamese ones, uh, marked ones do for some reason. So it's kind of interesting that that's how the Japanese sold it to them. Yeah. It's fascinating. But yeah, there was no carbine version of a Type 35. There was only the long rifle. Um, they were only made, I forget what the exact year they ended production. It was very short. 
Um, like three years, right? With the 38? Yeah, because basically once the Type 38 came into play, uh, the Navy just went with it because it was honestly a, a, a better design overall, um, which we'll talk about here a little bit. Yeah. But yeah, so finding a Type 35, if you find one like this, it's it's one of those rifles that's hard to, to gauge. You don't see enough sales. Honestly, like I've seen a few on gun broker the last two years have sold like 2,500 or more. Um, there was a, I've, I've kept a little bit of records. There was that one finish one last year. That was a bidding war between two fin collectors. Fin, yep. That went for about like, what was it? 6,200, 6,200. Yeah, that one was nuts. Uh, that's the, that's more the oddball one right. uh, in terms in terms of that, but and then, that uh, was two thin guys. I mean, a fin marked thirty five in the U.S. is tough to find. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then gray blanket. But yeah, that gray blanket had a real rough one. Um, like the the handguard was a little broken, like rusty. Yeah. Uh, I think that one was eighteen hundred. So you're yeah, which is that's good to know the range. Yeah, given the condition of that one, like one of these Siamese was I. It's funny I bought this from from Gray Blanket at a show, yeah, um, man, no way. in Pennsylvania, <laughs> and the price on it, I I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was very like ridiculously fair, uh, to the point where I bought it like within the first like forty, like after he'd set up, it was in the first forty minutes of like oh, setup man. day. I, think I just said I just buy it. Yeah. I just told him I'm just gonna buy it now. I'm not gonna even wait. Just I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, one of the, um, one of those rifles where if you are a Japanese collector and you see a Type 35 or or a Type 35 O2 45, you yeah. frankly like if you're interested in early Arasakas, you should just buy it. Like regard, yeah, a little bit of hesitation here, but like regardless of the price, because you will see them very, very, very rarely. Yeah, this is the only one I've ever. Uh, seen at the show so but yeah so that's the type 35 it was honestly when you break it down it was just a stop gap before the type 38 was developed which um we can talk about that too yeah yeah so that, so i mean that was also developed by nambu who as early as um like as he was like even before the 35 was fully developed like 1902 he was already trying to think of ideas and he based a lot of this off what the navy wanted in their rifle um but he also had things that he wanted to do so i can grab type 38 here better pick a good one man well this is a pretty good one this is the first going back to assembly numbers um the type 35 also followed the assembly number matching so the serial number has nothing to do with anything except just being the serial number uh they match by the number under the bottom of the receiver. The Type 38s, especially, you'll have most of the bolt parts, the rear sight parts, the handguard, the stock, the tangs themselves when you pop them off, the floor plate, the trigger guard, all that stuff is going to be um, matched by assembly number. And finding an early Type 38 that's fully assembly number matched is like ridiculously difficult. So at that same Allentown show, I was offered this one, which is minus the dust cover that was missing. I, I threw one on there just for looks, but uh, this one's fully matching, which is crazy hard to find. I, I'm really lucky to have this. So this one's about as original as you can get with a Tokyo rifle. Um, but yeah, so the big thing, the front, again, is exactly like a Type 35, essentially. You've got um, a front sight with no, pr no protective wings or anything on it. Um, they no longer have a brass cleaning rod. I did forget to say the Type 35 also used a brass cleaning rod. The one in mine's uh, a steel one, a replacement. But um, by the Type 38, you've got a steel cleaning rod without that little uh, hole in the top to help disassemble. You've still got uh, exposed barrel here with a, a half-length handguard. You no longer have that tangent rear sight. You've got a... Uh, ladder style which is the typical japanese style uh obviously now we've got a full dust cover that moves with the bolt which yeah, is yeah. one of the things that nambu wanted specifically with that and then the rear portion of it's the same style where you've got the two-piece stock and a, a flat yeah. metal bump in my mind when i think of the switch from like the 3035 to the 38 
is sort of like the Japanese. <laughs> Similarly with the Germans switching from the Gewehr 88 to the Mauser. And that's just kind of, and that's the way I simplify it in my mind. Is the, yeah. The, the, the 35 was just a stopgap at that point. So when you look at the 38, um, the big one is the bolt is ridiculously simplified at this point. Um, you've gone from nine parts, I, I think, nine parts on the 30 to just six parts. Uh, disassembly is ridiculously easy compared to most other rifles of the period that at least I can think of. Um, basically, when you take the bolt out, uh, if you push down the safety, twist it, everything just comes out. Your firing pin, your your firing pin spring, um, the... I guess I'll take that out. One of the other big ones is you've got a much larger extractor at this point. Yeah, they I forgot to, to show it on the three. Yep, you've got this is again Mauser based action. You've got um, you can see the classic style of a bolt release there. Um, you got that big long extractor that easily pops off. I mean, the safety basically twists, turn your bolt is field stripped at that point. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a super good system for disassembly. Oh, oh, I think the French copied that with the Moss 36. Yeah, a little. I, from what I, because I do like looking at 36 or uh, yeah, 36s, and they they do have kind of a similar thing going on. Um, you no longer have a hook. You've just got a yep. big old, big old safety with that intricate design on it. Um, early rifles will have this huge kind of tang sticking out. Uh, it does change later on. Um, because at this point, the 38, once this is developed, this is the standard rifle up until the Type 99. Um, that, for small arms, that tangle so, that's sticking out on the early safeties will interrupt your sight picture when it's activated, so that you can tell when your gun is on safe. Or yeah, not. that's pretty cool. Yeah, but, now, do you do you guys like have heard anything about the um, like the sort of reasoning for switching to that kind of style of safety? Uh, in my mind, it's switching from more of like a fine motor skill to a gross motor skill. So instead of needing to use fingers, you could just shove palm up against it and rotate um i don't know how it works with like thick gloves or anything but i don't know if that's like a reaction to maybe cold weather and yeah uh, and also something. just the fact that, that that hook safety i mean realistically it is another impediment for something to, to catch on something or yeah true or you know that's not as much with the 35 the 35 hook is a lot more it's it's more flush with the rifle itself, not like the the Type Thirty, but um, it is with the Thirty. You gotta pull it, twist it. This is literally just with your palm of your hand, yeah. so it is considerably simpler uh, than the Thirty Five, uh, Thirty or the Thirty Five. Um, honestly, I think the Thirty Five is actually more difficult to work than the uh, than the Type Thirty. To be honest, but it's off centered. Oh, they talked about it on CN Arsenal. May was having trouble with it um until she like she was having trouble with it until she like looked at it if you look down um if you look down i don't know if i'm going to be able to get the angle right um the center you see how the safety is slightly off centered where you would think it would be yeah. just equidistant but it's not it's slightly further that way yeah so this was so much i mean the Type 38 is just such a simple design, and it's just such a robust rifle, to be honest. Um, the biggest faults with it, in terms of like stuff that didn't change, it still has that floor plate release that is detached from the rifle. I mean, now you can see they switched to this um, this style of spring, which was, I think, more... I, I think it helps with feeding a bit. It is a much stronger str uh, spring, and it's just a simpler design than that that coil looking one. Yeah, kind of straight from the Mauser uh style spring. Yeah, exactly. So I um I think the thirty eight uh, thirty eight, especially the the carbine as far as just how it's probably the strongest action of uh, of World War One, like of its of its era, but um to me I think it's arguably probably one of the one of the the best, if not like one of the best uh bolt actions of World War One. Yeah. yeah. And so they did do it in a carbine form as well, as we just said. So here it is. Um, 
basically the same. This one's a later one. So this is one um, made by Kokura. So this would have been made in like the uh, the late 30 or the mid 30s, but same style. So it's got um, protected front sights on the carbine from the beginning. And that's I did forget to mention that with the Type 30 carbine. The Type 30 carbine started the uh, front sight protectors. The long rifle did not have it. Uh, the carbine versions did. And when the Type 38 was developed, it was the same way. They had the carbine version has the front sight protectors. Original Type 38s do not have those at all. Um, it is side slung. I did forget to mention that too with the 38 uh, or the 30 carbine. It is side slung. The long rifle is underslung. Um, it does have a shorter, obviously a little shorter pattern rear sight. It does have a full handguard for the carbine. Um, cleaning rod. This one's a little different. This has a little kind of shorter style tank because it was made later. Um, but yeah, the Type 38 carbine is ridiculously handy. It is yeah. crazy. Um, this one I have shot pretty pretty extensively, and it's just it's with the six five cartridge. Um, it just handles so well. Yeah, yeah. Have and you seen I know, my video where I sh I shoot my uh, 38 carbine out in the mountains? Yeah. Yeah, like yep. one. just the the echo. I just couldn't get over it of the the thump off the mountains. But yeah, that's yeah. It's being so light and handy, and with certain guns, like we say, it's something shooting like an eight millimeter cartridge. It's you almost kind of don't want it to get too short because of that, you know, muzzle blast. But with the with the six five, it, it's it's almost perfect in that little short handy handy package. One of the most ridiculous carvings I've ever owned was the. Uh, I had one of those Persian like Muscatoons, uh, the mm -hmm. M M thirty, right? M thirty, yeah. And that's an eight millimeter, and that thing was nuts shooting that thing. So it's about as long as this, but in eight millimeter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that thing had the one of the biggest fireballs I've seen, and it kicked real bad. Uh, yeah. Crazy cool rifle, but I would never want to have to use that. <laughs> yeah you shoot that thing right. once and then you don't want to shoot it anymore but something like that a 6.5 is, is is perfect for those little carbines yeah, you actually will want to shoot it yeah and it's ridiculously light and handy it's just a really good design um so originally tokyo produced about 2 million type 38s and they made about uh 200 or 200 wow 210,000 carbines um for the original production later on they switched to through four other arsenals uh which we'll kind of touch upon here so they're pretty common like i said with the type 38s from uh from uh tokyo finding one that's matching and mummed is almost impossible finding a type 38 carbine from tokyo that's mummed and matching is nearly impossible um, so typical cost is going to be like mm, 400 to $500 for a, a, a Tokyo made rifle that's ground mismatched, maybe like school marked, um, the carbines will get more. You can get into like the 700 range. Um, once you start getting into like mum matching ones, we'll talk a little bit about the Kokura, the Nagoya ones, but those ones are going for the. The eight hundred range, eight to nine hundred dollars, probably for those. I was going to mention this little guy. This was my first uh, Type Thirty Eight carbine. It was it was kind of when I was in the beginning of collecting Arasakas, and uh, they said it was mismatched. You know, because all the uh, all the numbers, yeah, because all the numbers didn't match the number on the receiver. But all the numbers matched each other, which was quite odd. And then, yeah, I took this, I took it apart, and uh, yep, it was a assembly number gun. Was your is that thing fully assembly number matched? Yeah, yeah, and it has a mum. Oh, that's little. That's no. Oh, that's nuts. That is incredibly hard to find, like crazy hard. Um, I was watching one on Proxy Bit a few months ago that I really wanted. It was in pretty nice shape. Um, I think is the dust cover matching on that one too. I think so. I can't. That's, I can't remember. It's been a while, but yeah, I think that. Let's see. Yeah. So. Nice. 
I, yeah, again, yeah. it's a gun broker find. I got it for like 500 bucks because it was. Oh, that's expensive. crazy. Yeah, that's. I've. So I've never had the chance. That one I saw on Proxy, but it sold for like $1,500, I think. Um, oh, damn. It's not. It's crazy. Finding an original matching Coker or a Tokyo Arsenal carbine or long rifle is just really hard to find because, I mean, they were just around for so long and they saw so much use in in china in the pacific at home as as training rifles so like there's just and and so many of the parts like the floor plate especially is like a common part you're like you'll find rifles that almost completely match except for the floor plate because it just pops out so easily oh how yeah. much does the lack of a mum affect the the value so like danny's would be a 1500 dollars gun as is but if it was missing the mum what would that drop it um, to? It'd be like honestly, with a rifle like that, it'd probably be a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. Like I know, like typically, I don't put a lot of money in the mum, but when you have a rifle like that, that's just so special. Um, the more complete it is, the more it's it's worth. Yeah. Um, so I would say, uh, you know, it take and, and it could be worth more because there's a lot of guys I know, I know collectors that do not have like they've been collecting Japanese rifles for thirty, forty years that don't have um assembly number matched 38s it's it's just so hard to find so sweet. for the right for the right thing it, it it could even with a ground mom it would still be worth a decent amount cool yeah i had no idea when i got this thing um and and that's and that's common a lot of, a, most most average especially guys at a gun show are not going to know that that's assembly number match. They're going to sell it as a mismatch gun. And I've seen that on gun yeah. broker before too. So that's cool. That's a great, that's a, that's a crazy good find. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. It was just, I just saw a mom and it was 500 bucks. So yeah, but that's covered everything. I was like, well, I got, it sounds like a good one. So this was kind of my early one. And this is like my later type 38, not trying to skip us forward, but uh, probably should move along a little bit, but this is a later, Muck, Muckton, yeah, thirty-eight carbine with that. So yeah, so once, interesting aperture sight, which is kind of common. Yeah, that. so once we get into the thirties here, so so obviously uh, Tokyo Artillery Arsenal, like I mentioned before, they were the only makers of these like rifles and carbines up until the nineteen twenties, and once you get into nineteen twenty-three, that's when the big kind of change happens. Um. I guess we should briefly touch upon because I didn't mention this. I mean, it was its own development, but um, the type type forty four. So uh, that was made nineteen eleven is when that was adopted. Uh, basically, it is a type thirty eight carbine with a bayonet housing attached to it. Um, specifically made for cavalry. Uh, with the idea, I mean, it's just. You just have a folding bayonet that just goes right up like that. Um, with the idea being one less thing for cavalry to carry, they didn't have to have uh, a Type Thirty bayonet. When they're already, yeah, when they're already carrying like the Type Thirty Two cavalry sword and all this other stuff, just one less thing. Um, these they only made. What do we do? So basically, ninety one thousand. Uh, Type 44 is between all the different arsenals. So originally it was just made by Tokyo Artillery Arsenal. Later on, Nagoya and Kokura also made some. Um, but yeah, they're even though they made a pretty decent amount and they survived in good numbers, they they get pretty good prices. I mean, a mum's later production like Type 44 is easily like a twelve hundred to fifteen hundred dollar gun. Um, even when Japanese rifles didn't have a lot of value, these ones always did just because it just looks goofy. I mean, that, that whole assembly is just so big and weird looking. It's just like distinctly Japanese. It's got your, your hook basically to make up for the quillion that would be on the type 30 bayonet um, to help with like stacking and stuff like that. It is um, a vicious bayonet too. Like you, you compare it to the Carcano, and it's just yeah. laughable how flimsy the Carcano is. And you look at this one, and it's just, it looks mean. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and later on, the Jap- 
Yeah, it's know? true. And yeah. so the Japanese ended up. So the original ones have very close screws like this. Uh, I don't have a second one. There's three variations of this. Basically, you got the early one like this. that's flat to the stock. Two screws very close together. Later on, they make one where the screws are a little bit farther apart like this. And the housing's a lot bigger. And um, I can grab it. The last one. The last one's a much beefier housing where it even has this little extension off here to give more um, separation to the screw. And the funny thing is they didn't develop this. They made this for probably probably 20 years or more with the original style. And then eventually in the 1930s, they switched to this style. So for some reason, it, it took that long for them to decide to make that change. Yeah, it's really but interesting. Other than that, I mean, other than that, there's not a lot of difference between the type. And, and um, it does yeah. have a a hole in the butt stock for your cleaning rod, which if you do have one that has a cleaning rod in it, that's a couple hundred bucks right there. Uh, they're yeah, pretty hard to find. Mine, uh, whenever, whenever you buy one, uh, check for it. Mine had half of a cleaning rod in there. Um, in that's still something. Yeah. <laughs> in your yeah. 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 So, um, so yeah. One, so, another note, no, go ahead, sorry. the, the dust cover on the type 44 is not compatible with the 38. Right or I think it, I think that's true, isn't it? Like slightly, it should it it should be. They're they're all all the like the thirty eight, the thirty eight carbine, the forty four are all the same action. So the dust cover does fit on the on the forty four as well. Same thing. Okay. Um, I must be just thinking ninety nine and thirty eight. The ninety nine thirty eight does have a difference. Uh, yeah. With the dust cover, the original ones have a small like L bracket kind of. Mm -hmm welded inside the dust cover i don't have one handy to show you but those are what the early ones have um but yeah so i mean in terms of 38s that's the early stuff uh the later rifles i can try to find one real quick just to briefly talk about so my understanding with the later ones later 38s the progression isn't a whole lot in any like mechanical things it was just sort of like the the shape of this safety changed rear yep. sides changed and uh yes. front side front side there, yeah there so, front side. so right. post 1923 on um, the Tokyo the uh the great Kanto earthquake so on September 1st huge earthquake um up to 105,000 people died uh as a result of that and the Tokyo arsenal was not completely destroyed but it was heavily heavily damaged um, to the point where production was in like, you know, the, the hundreds for mo like basically months and months and months, they make a few hundred rifles. Uh, so at that point, Japan had already been considering expanding their arsenals to other areas. And that was kind of the final nail in the coffin in terms of like, we need to do something about this. So at that point is where we get all the other arsenals that start making type 38s and eventually type 99s. So after that you've got kokura which a lot of people one of the biggest confusions with the type 38s is what's the difference between the kokura marked ones and the tokyo marked ones um because they share the exact same arsenal mark it's that can the, the cannonball stacked uh basically because kokura inherited all of tokyo's uh equipment for the most part so they shared the same arsenal mark but it just depends on when it was made. Like you have to look at the features of it. Um, for the most part, and well, not even for the most part, all Tokyo made guns have no series mark. They made them sequentially from zero to two million. Uh, no series mark. After the Kanto earthquake and the reorganization of the arsenals, that's where you start seeing what we call the series marks on the rifles. Part of it was essentially to help with uh, errors in serial numbers. Because at that point, you're getting into the 2 million range. You're hand stamping all these different numbers to the point where it was getting difficult, where there were considerable errors with it. Um, and the series mark helped stop that. So you basically make a group of 100,000 rifles, and then you start over from zero again with a new series mark. Um, so originally, you have Kokura and Nagoya are the two arsenals that kind of take over Type 38 production afterwards. Um, eventually, you have Mukden, 
in uh, China, in occupied Manchuria, and Jinsen in Korea. Uh, Jinsen only made, they, they made, um, I forget the total number off the top of my head, but basically Jinsen rifles are very small amount, uh, under 100,000. Uh, Mukden, they made a pretty decent amount. So if you find a Jensen Type 38, those are worth a decent amount of money because there just aren't nearly as many. Um, it's the opposite way with Type 99s. When you get to Type 99s, Jensen made a ton of them. Mukden Type 99s are incredibly rare uh, to the point where I saw a barreled action sell for a thousand plus dollars. Oh man, <laughs> just, I, they're almost unheard of. Um, they mostly came in with the imports from the 80s from China uh, to the point they, they didn't really issue those out too much. They were made very late in World War II. Um, but yeah, so at that point, you start getting into a late pattern type 38. So something like this guy, you can see by this point, we are now using protected front sights on um, the long rifles as well. And you have, and this isn't on all of them, but... Like Danny showed there, you've got uh, a peep sight on the uh, the rear sight. So only a few arsenals did that. Kokura didn't make any that had that, but Nagoya and Mukden were the two big ones that you will see a peep sight on. Um, and it's kind of like a trap. They call it a trapezoid style. It's kind of it's hard to see, but basically it's a. Uh, you can see right there. It's not curved like the ninety nine is. It peaks up like a pyramid, goes down. So. That's the more common one you'll see on the on the 38 later ones. And then some of the arsenal switch to a cup butt plate like this. Uh, which is just, again, it wasn't every arsenal. It's, it, that's the interesting thing about these rifles is that, and I know, it's, you know, you got other countries that did the same thing, but they didn't standardize everything between every arsenal. So Kokura kept doing a flat butt plate the entire time, basically. But Nagoya switched to that um, cupped one at some point. So you'll also see the bluing. I mean, it's hard to see on camera, but the bluing is a lot different. It's a lot deeper than on the uh, the early 38s. You've got... Um, you can see on this one, we've got where it's more of the Type 99 style, where you've got the notch for the safety. You've still got that like intricate kind of knurling on it. Um, and the bolts are blued now, which the uh, the Type 38 bolts were not originally blued. They were in the white. But other than that, the Type 38 design didn't change all that much um, through the end of production. You basically got the same style like this, uh, minus like mechanically it stayed exactly the same uh, with the, just a few differences with like the sight and stuff like that. Um, yeah. My understanding was that the Type 38 kind of stayed the standard issued rifle up to about 42. Yeah, so um, they were making Type 38s up until basically right around the time Type 99 production started to actually really take off. So uh, Jensen was one of the last arsenals to really make 38s. Oh. They made those in time because the Jensen arsenal wasn't even around until around that time. Uh, so they only made around like 13, it's 13,000. That's how much 13,000 type 38s made at Jensen. So they're very uncommon, but they barely made any before they switched over to type 99s. Um, so yeah, but other than that, I mean, they stayed essentially the same until you start getting into the type 99s and there's a whole development in terms of how that kind of happened. Um, and it starts a lot earlier than people think. Uh, so a lot of people think that it wasn't until the 30s that the Japanese really started thinking about changing their cartridge. But it was honestly as early as the 1920s that they started thinking about that, um, the switch to the 7.7. So we also should kind of bring up at this point, we're getting into the end of the Meiji era. So once you get into the, um, the, 19, the mid 1912 to 1926, you're in the Taisho era. And you kind of go back to where now we're starting over. So you've got the Type 10, like, for example, you've got a Type 10 knee mortar that was made in 1921. And so it can get confusing there where you start seeing stuff. It seems yeah, like it's yeah. going backward in time. But yeah, yeah. It's, the numbers kind of restart with, you know, I show. Yes. Yeah. So and then obviously like the type, the type 14, for example, made, you know, certain 1925. 
Um, mm-hmm. Even though it looks like it's way earlier than uh, than uh, the Type 13 Marauder or something. So I can get that's the that's one of the biggest, especially early on. I was super confused by that. I did not understand how that worked in terms oh, of that. So it took me a while to figure that out. And then you get the switch from, you know, uh, from the reign of the emperor to the the Japanese style calendar for Type 94 and Type 99 and on through. Yeah. On through that. Once you switch. So after 1926, you switch over to the, the Shawa era. But then instead of using the start of that, they switch to the standard Japanese calendar at that point. Um, and that's how you get going from like a type 10 meme order in 1921 to the type 89 in 1929. So it can get that's where it gets real confusing. And that's how you get to the type 99. Um, give me one second. I'll be right back, guys. Um, do okay. you mind if I cover long 99s, Conrad? Yeah, so, go right ahead. Hold awesome. on. Before we get into long 99s, I want to do bring up that... Um, you go ahead, and, go ahead, Conrad. This is just uh, substitute stuff. So, uh, the Japanese military also did purchase quite a lot of uh, Can 88 ks and uh, VZ-24s for use in the invasion of China uh, in 1937. Uh, they, it was uh, domestic production could not keep up, obviously. Uh, oh yeah, it was a rivalry thing. What was it? The the navy couldn't get yep. arms, so they yeah. So um, so the uh, I believe according to my information here. Now this is obviously roughly uh, they purchased. Um, Around 20,000 K-98Ks from Nazi Germany. Uh, and they purchased uh, around 40,000 uh, VZ-24s uh, from Czechoslovakia. Uh, and, then, and then also we get into the uh, special one, which is the naval one, which is the Type I. Uh, the Type 1, you mean? The Type 1, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, so, I said that for those that don't get it. So Conrad, Everybody calls it the Type One because it's a Conrad, Roman I was just talking about the the purchase of the K ninety eight Ks and the oh, uh, VZ twenty fours that Japan did during the very beginning of the invasion of China. We're talking about the Type One, and then we're also talking about the Type One, <laughs> as Danny likes to call it. Um, it is. I'm oh, just type, trying to trigger these guys. The Type I. <laughs> Uh, this is back and forth to the the bitter hatred rivalry of the Japanese militaries, uh, the air, uh, the uh, navy, and the army, uh, because the navy was or the navy was not given priority for production. Uh, they were stuck with uh, less firearms, and as a result, I think Michael has grabbed his example. Yeah, so I, so Japan contracted with Italy for um, essentially a Carcano type action in a Type 38 rest of the rifle. Um, this one was made by Beretta, so I held out for a long time for a Beretta contract. And mine actually has the sling is numbered to the uh, receiver number on the um on the on the rifle so pretty cool uh pretty cool combination of different collecting stuff if you like if you like carcanos you can now does it have, have a mom uh no yeah so that's the other thing is that uh it's literally it's the it's the series number and then the serial number are the only markings on these guys now those never um, did have a num a mom is what you're saying right correct We've got some weird things like the trigger trigger guard is a lot larger than the Type 38, and then the stocks are generally unfinished, so they just feel a little funky. Um, and you can have some that are shorter too. They, yeah, they yeah, mine's, yeah, yep, mine's about an inch shorter than the Type 38s. Um, yeah, and I think remind me, Conrad, if I'm wrong, but didn't the Japanese do that to shorten the length of pole right here? Yeah, and so um, was- you know, 
Yeah, they did. Yep. So that's why you'll see two different ones. Cause I think the Italians originally were making them a certain way and the Japanese had to interject to tell them that's the way the, the length they wanted for it. It looks yep. like uh Barone um, was only 30,000. Uh, uh, yeah. total production is right around 120,000 is what it says was, was ordered. And what's interesting with it is even though it was made by the Italians, the Japanese still had them put uh, a two piece stock. So it still has that stock split yep. in it. Even though it's a made by the Italians, <laughs> it's a different cleaning rod. Mine does not have a cleaning rod, which is a bummer. Uh, but there's a different cleaning rod than the Type 38s. Um, type I cleaning rods have a, a five pointed star on them, and the the length I think is just slightly off. I don't have how many inches it is, but I wanted yeah, to, that's, I that's, wanted to get into these because this is still six point five. Before we yeah. got into the the yes. Type 99, we switched to seven point seven. Yeah, good call. It's interesting, right? When you when you first get into Japanese rifles, you're just like, oh, it's the Type 38 and the Type 99. But then, like any other collecting field, you you quickly mm -hmm. realize that it's just so much more nuanced. Yeah. So yeah. in in my work, the Japanese use a term they call kaizen, which translates to continuous improvement. And you can see this is how they traditional they follow this idea in their firearms development it is continuously making changes to it and um like you said uh similar to the british i suppose in that regard in and except they don't probably redesignate the entire rifle each time they make and a add, change and add 50 stars yeah. to every uh, <laughs> It doesn't get a the brand new designation every time there's a change, but it makes it a nightmare to figure out what is what is what. And like you guys were talking about, oh, this should have a, 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 a dust cover, but well, it's getting close to this time period, so maybe it doesn't. But then yeah, no, this yeah, well, overlaps yeah. with that. Once you, get into, once you get into the 99s, it gets real. We'll talk a little bit about it, but it gets real confusing in terms of what's correct, what's not. And if your rifle is right, how it is. All right. Like well, going let's, into, let's get into the 99s. The final. So to get into the 99s, we're going to start with this 38. So up into the 1920s, the Japanese had already started looking at uh, adopting a new cartridge. The 6.5 round um, just wasn't cutting it overall. Um, which they knew even as early as the Russo-Japanese War that that cartridge was, um, it was wounding more than it was killing. Which is obviously, you know, you still have the 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 benefit. You wound somebody, you know, it takes as many other people to take care of that person. You're you're causing other kinds of problems to the your enemy, but it just was not working, especially in China, um, in the kind of combat that they were fighting in. So. As early as that, they started looking into developing um, another round. So they originally had the semi-rimless, which I'm not an expert on the heavy machine guns, but originally they had the 7.758 semi-rimless round that was tested for the Type 89 and the Type 92 machine guns. Um, and the tests show that a rimless cartridge had better performance. So this leads to the development of the 7.7 round for the rifles. So this rifle right here is probably one of the rarest guns I own. Um, this is a type 38 converted to seven, seven Japanese. So it's got some differences that are not very evident until you look a little bit closer. Um, it's very shiny overall. It, looks, it is very shiny. A lot of people going back to like refinish. This is original stock. It's got perfectly struck proofs on the stock. Um, completely original. It's just, uh, this one probably sat in an arsenal and it never, I mean, these, these conversions probably never got issued or anything. It was in an arsenal. Um, first big difference, the cleaning rod, which I actually did not know this till I bought the thing. Uh, it screws in. So this is the, um, this is something they didn't end up using with the 99, but it does have a screw in cleaning rod rather than being held in by, uh, your spring here, which I didn't, I didn't mention that with the 38, but the cleaning rod is actually held in by the, your, your front band release. So first thing they did was do that. Um, the rear sight, it's hard to tell, but it is considerably shorter. Uh, yeah. And the hanging guard is actually longer than a regular one to make up for that. So they did adjust the rear sight for the ballistics of the 7.7. Um, 
Again, you won't be able to see it, but they are marked. This one's marked kind of unusually. Typically, the 7.7 conversions have this big kind of like hand etched kanji on the barrel that basically says 7.7 conversion and, and the number, the serial number of it. Um, this one, you'll see it has a stock, uh, a recoil bolt, which normally you will not see on a Type 38. Um, the Japanese did not have a recoil bolt on the standard 38 because obviously a 6.5 caliber is not, they weren't too worried about that with, in terms of recoil damaging the stock. Um, yeah, other than that, it's a standard 38 that they basically converted to 7.7 as like a, a testing bed. Um, overall production of these is thought to be less than 300. Um, oh, that's so awesome, they're, man. yeah, they're very hard to find. I, this one's kind of funny. I lucked out. A guy messaged me on my jap on my website I run, um, and told me how his dad brought this home and he was looking to sell it. So that's how I lucked into this one. Um, because otherwise I would not. He he knew it was seven seven. He didn't know it was special until I told him it was. Okay. Um, and so I made him a a pretty good offer because he was looking to sell. Just uh, his his dad brought home like, I he sold off most of it. He brought home like Type forty fours, uh, Nambus, like swords and all the stuff with all with capture papers. And this was one of the only things he had left. Um, because he thought it was kind of weird that it was in seven seven. So, but yeah, so I was pretty happy about that because this is one of those things that you just don't see. So, um, most of them, I think the big majority of them were 38 carbines, actually. They converted a lot of the carbines. Somebody in the Discord has one. Now I forget who it is, um, or his dad does. He has one of the 38 carbines that's con uh, converted to 7.7. So, uh, the Japanese did this through the 30s. And uh, some of these might have been done in the 20s. There's, there's just not a lot of detail about this. Like, I know we didn't really touch on this, but a lot of records for Japanese rifles are just gone. There's nothing that exists. Did they get bombed or something? They might have been bombed, I've oh. heard. Uh, to the point where maybe not much exists anymore. And after the war, the Japanese did a pretty good job of just destroying all their records. Like, are you, are you uh, saying they the big example I can think of? Yeah. The biggest example I can think of is in Jensen, the, uh, the commander of that arsenal he knowingly destroyed all paperwork about stuff. There was nothing left for the Americans to find when they got there. So in terms of this stuff, a lot of it's just guesstimates by collectors based off looking at different rifles, what little information we do have, like concrete dates. There's not a lot. Um, Cause that's one of the other most common things you get asked is when was my rifle made, especially with the type 99s. And my honest answer when people ask is, I can't tell you. I don't know. It's all a guess. Um, but yeah, so these were done in the 1930s, and then that eventually leads into um, the development of the Type 99. And I know we talked about it, but we've got, originally, the plan was to make two different rifles, just like with the Type uh, 38. So there's going to be a long rifle and a short rifle. Um, so originally you have a Type 99 long, like this one, that is basically the same length as a Type 38 um, with, uh, with a, a new action. Well, not really a new action, but it's, it's converted, or uh, it's in 7.7 now, basically. So you've got a few differences. You've still got your front sight protectors. They carried those over from the late production 99s or uh, 38s. You've still got that exposed barrel here and the shorter handguard here. You'll notice we now have the first monopod. Well, not the first monopod. The first monopods were actually on the Type 97 snipers. So you'll see a little bit of like transitioning between the 38 and the 99, especially in the 30s. So the uh, 97 snipers actually did have a monopod exactly like the, uh, the Type 99 monopod or long monopod. Um, yeah, and that You've got, monopod is, is kind of controversial. Like, most people think they're kind of junky, which I'm not going to say they're, like, the best thing ever. But um, if you ever lay down prone with it and then put the monopod down, it kind of puts it kind of almost perfectly uh, level, like, as far as, you know, shooting, like, distance with it. It's, it's one of those things that gets a lot more flack than it deserves, probably. Um, 
I mean, yeah. it's definitely not a perfect design. Like if you look at enough auctions and, and 99s in them, you'll see a lot that where this thing is just like wavy from being just bent so much. Uh, Cause it is flimsy to be honest. Yeah, it's yeah. the idea behind it is definitely sound. Like I, I can understand that for sure. But um, it is just a very flimsy design uh, in terms of the strength of the, in, in terms of the strength of the the metal of this and how it is, I mean, which what would you expect with basically a, a little wire monopod yeah, like that? Super long wire, yeah. I think for collectors, um, it's things like that that make Japanese rifles so interesting, right? You've got the just such a wide variation of features on the standard, you know, the standard yeah. model, and it's such a sought after feature that like they make reproductions of them. Yeah, you know, and that's something now yeah. you have to look for on Type ninety nope. nines. Is is it a reproduction or original monoplash? Especially now, um, because there are a lot. So like, and talk about ninety nine long monopods. I know I mentioned it in the intro, but they are just incredibly rare. Most of these. So we'll get into it here in a second. But most of these just were not issued outside of Japan, probably to any extent. Um. But yeah, so it's got your Tangier site. Although now you can see we've got our first iteration of the anti-aircraft sites. Which again is kind of like a controversial sort of thing. Because yeah. people, I think when people think of the AA sites, they go to, wow, why would they think they could shoot down, you know, like a P-50, whatever, Mustang flying over, like, oh, that's stupid. But it's like, well, when they thought of that, they were shooting at slow biplanes in China. Yep. So it yep. wasn't like they were, yeah. And it was not supposed to be one guy, you know, yeah. sniping. Yeah, not one guy. Him. Yeah. That's the other thing. It would it's be not a the whole lone marksman myth here in the US. It's the yeah. Yes. You would have your whole group shooting at that. Um now realistically, it, did it do I mean, was it a useful feature? I don't I mean it's kind of interesting. I wish there was some kind of documentation out there about the the uh success or lack thereof of that. Because the interesting thing is with the 99s, most of them never really made it to China. Most of them were used in the, the actual Pacific theater. So you never even saw a lot of them go to China where they were actually really designed for. Right. Because kind of going back to like Italy, where right on the cusp of World War II, they're trying to change calibers. It's the same thing with the Japanese. And they were never able to fully obviously switch over to a 7.7 seven round. So most of your units in China... They'd been there for you know decades at that point. Six five was being produced, you know, in country and and everyone was armed with a type thirty eight. It just made more sense to use the type thirty eight more in China and not try to introduce a whole nother caliber there. It says on the Wikipedia that the intention was the type ninety nine would have fully replace the thirty eight after the Japanese victory in China. Which obviously <laughs> never happened. Um, but yeah, so the original plan was to do that and then do your short, what they call Type 99 short. Now, when it comes to collector terms, nobody calls it that because it's just kind of silly. There's, there's so few Type 99 longs. So basically they made around 38,000 um, Type 99 longs and that's it before they realized it was not the, the, the shorter barrel length of the, the short rifle was not nearly as much of a detriment to like justify a whole nother production line. So the 99 long, most of the parts are interchangeable, but obviously the stocks are not, the rear sights are different. The monopods are different clean. You know, a, a lot of parts are different and it just did not make sense to produce both. Um, so they look at making, going- a long rifle and carbine 99 or a long rifle and short rifle 99 so the original intent was a short rifle the the testing from the 1930s and like the early the late 20s and stuff with like converting 38 carbines to 77 it just did not work it was just kind of like i'll talk about okay so they knew yeah 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 Yeah, they knew it was not Wikipedia entry says that they tried 44s as well and they said that it said the uh, yes. the recoil was excessive as well as muzzle flash. Right. Yep. Yeah, there are there's some really interesting if you ever buy um kind of the Bible of type nine or uh, 
of, of Japanese rifles, uh, military rifles of Japan by Fred Honeycutt. Um, there are some pictures of some of those oddball conversions like that, the, the 44s and stuff like that, that they tried converting the 7.7. Um, and it just did not work. So Sounds similar to short the, rifle, the German Can 88K when they first tried to use the original uh, S Patron and they were like, oh shit, this is way too much muzzle flash. Yeah, it, it was way too much. So the short rifle was a good kind of intermediate, like, and and that, and that's what a lot of the countries were going towards anyway. I mean, yeah, you look we, at like K ninety eight K and stuff like that, and even like the the O three. It was already yeah, a good bit shorter. earlier, kind of starting in the yeah in the early nineteen hundreds to like the thirties is kind of when you see the big big switch over for everybody. And Japanese yep, just lagging a little bit behind there. And they were, and and that's why as they developed the ninety nine, it was just realized that was silly to have that extra. Um, right. I forget how many inches it is. A couple inches extra for the long rifle. The 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 accuracy difference. I know there's some documentation about, it, but it was just so minimal. It was like this is not worth our time. So basically, after they made those few thousand rifles, it was decided to focus only on the short pattern. So um, when collectors talk about Type 99 shorts or when they talk about Type 99 rifle. Uh, usually they're referring to the short rifle, but nobody ever uses that terminology really. Cause yeah, it's, you, have to, you have to add the long, long type 99 when you want to refer yeah. to the, you know, the long well, we're looking at a production of 38,000 versus three and a half million. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Go with the one that it's kind of crazy. And it's kind of crazy. crazy when you break down 99, like the type 99. So it was developed, not, adopted in 1939 Production didn't really start until probably 1940 um, for the long rifles and the short rifles. It's thought production didn't start until like, I believe, mid 1941. Um, So really, they made all those millions of rifles in basically, you know, four years. Uh, Which is kind of nuts to think about, like the Type 99 had a very short service life relative to a lot of other rifles. And and after World War II, they weren't really nobody used it. Like I mean, you have some made in China post war, um, and some usage of it there. But honestly, most nobody used nobody's using seven seven Japanese after World War II for yeah, any even the, even the Type ninety nine still being used. Like the U S converted some of them to thirty out six. Right, we didn't use surplus seven yeah. seven. Yeah, in, yeah, in Korea, most, most of the ones um, after the war, it says that. If they were used, it was converted to something. So KMT changed them to eight millimeter Mauser. South Korea oh. and Thailand used them in thirty out six, and then uh, uh, there's also the PRC conversions to seven sixty by thirty nine. Yep. Yes. But yeah, Absolutely. other than that, other than that, the ninety nines just did not see a lot of usage at all. It's kind of crazy when you really think about it. It was basically a four year period that the 99s were used. Um, but in that four years, the amount of changes are pretty staggering compared to some of the other countries. Um, like obviously given, with the, sorry, Conrad, just given the time, the, do we want to go over kind of broad strokes, the maybe not breaking down by series, but just, generally yeah, yeah. how the type 99 changed over the course of the war absolutely so when it comes to the 99s obviously being developed right on the cusp of the japanese entering world war ii um there were a lot of changes so you start with your early rifle that has all your extra features you've got the short rifle also has the monopod full-length cleaning rod um it should be mentioned chrome line bore first i believe it's the first military military service yeah. rifle that has a chrome line bore um and a chrome bolt face as well so the japanese were thinking kind of ahead of, in some regards i guess but yeah first military rifle with a chrome line bore uh super high quality um the 99s just i think it's I mean, I still think the 38 carbine shooting those is the best, but these are a good mix between all the different features you'd want to have in terms of like a caliber and stuff like that. Um, I still think the best version of a 99 is the mid-war one I'll talk about in a bit, but 
these early ones are definitely high quality guns. They're well built. The parts are great. Um, the stocks are well finished and, and the bluing is really nice on most of the early ones. Um, it's important to note that there were a total of nine different arsenals that made these things. Uh, Kokura Nagoya, uh, Toyo Kogyo, um, Tokyo Juki Kogyo, which produced them both under supervision from Nagoya and Kokura. So there's two different ones. Um, Izawa, Hawa, Jensen, and Mukden. So it's kind of nuts how many different arsenals made these things. Uh, so collecting them is like a giant pain in the butt. Uh, <laughs> if you want to have as many different ones as yeah, you that's can. quite the rabbit hole. Yeah. It's, and they're all a little different. So um, in terms of production, let me just see if I have a short rifle here. Um, this is a good one just to show a quick difference. So this would be, this is actually a pretty rare rifle. This is a fourth series of Zawa, but you can know this right off the bat. Everything looks the same up here. One of the big differences you'll see is a rear band with no monopod attachment whatsoever. Um, one of the first features to go on these rifles actually was the monopod. So I usually use Nagoya as my baseline because Nagoya produced the most. Um, and generally the other arsenals kind of follow the same pattern as them. So when you look at Nagoya rifles, the first couple series are all complete. First thing to go is the monopod. Um, I, I don't like know how... Just... It seems like they just left them off. Like they kept all like the base hardware for like where it would yes. attach to and just stopped attaching them, which is yeah. a weird thing for collectors because then you got to know whether or not it was removed or it's, it never had it in the first place. Yeah. Like your rifle earlier, Danny, that uh, what I believe was a fifth series. I think that had the attachment, right? Uh, had the point uh, for it? No, it does not. Maybe not. No, yours doesn't. Okay. Some of them do, especially, yeah, some of those fifth series rifles do have the attached. I have one that has that. So it looks just like an early rifle. It's got a dust cover AA sights, but it's got a monopod attachment point with no monopod on it. And it's 100% correct. That's one of the big problems is obviously with the lack of records to find this kind of stuff out. We have, as Japanese collectors, we just have to look at rifles and early on it. In the early eight or in the late eighties, nineties, um, guys would just submit data sheets to those big collectors like like Frank Allen and stuff, and they would say, "What does your rifle have?" And you'd write down, you know, all these different features. And through collecting hundreds of those, that's how a lot of this stuff was figured out. Uh, the problem is that a lot of people will see a rifle that has a monopod point and be like, "Well, I got to put it on there," and it just it never had it. Um, to the point where there's been ones that have been on so long, you start getting the wear marks on the front of the rifle that show like it looks like it's been there forever when it hasn't. So that's one of the things. That's why when guys ask me, you know, should the, I, I'm going to add the monopod, I'm going to add the AA sites. I have, I say you got to look at what you have first because um, it all depends. Uh, this rifle is interesting going on that same note. You've got the attachment points for AA wings, but they never had it. This rifle never had them on there. Um, it, 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 it's another one that guys like to add on AA sites. My favorite is I'll see the seventh series rifles that have the really short, they, they cut off about an inch of the rear sight and guys will try to add the AA sites on the seventh series rifles. And literally it doesn't fit because they got rid of that because they weren't putting AA sites on there. So you'll see guys try to oh, yeah. fit these AA wings on here and they like actually rub up against the wood. Like, so it doesn't even fold down. So people will try to add whatever they want to these things, and it's just not correct. Just from um, just from a manufacturing standpoint, given what I do, that's probably a case of they had parts, and to make the change point, they were just like, we'll just use up the leftover parts until we actually switch over. That's 100% it. Um, especially with Nagoya, once you get into the 5th and 6th series, which is kind of more mid-war, like probably 42, early 43, you'll start to see times where you'll see that kind of rear sight I just showed, but you'll also have one that doesn't have any attachment points whatsoever. But they'll be all kind of mixed in together because they were just using essentially whatever was there. Um, but yeah, so the first major part to get eliminated was the monopod. 
even before that, they switched to a screw in cleaning rod, which isn't on this example. This is a full length one. But um, a lot of the transitional ones literally have just it's not even a I guess you couldn't even really call it a cleaning rod. It's just like a little stacking rod that just screws in. It only goes about it just like looks like this. a rod. Yeah. Yeah. It just goes about this deep into the rifle. It doesn't even have like a full cut in the cleaning rod for like a, for like using like a, a, a swab or anything. So that was the first big change. Then the monopod. Um, then you start seeing the AA sites go away. And then final, the final thing to disappear was the dust cover in terms of like before they switched to the last ditch rifles, um, which we can talk a little bit about the dust cover briefly and what, what collectors think and the FUD lore. I mean, you will hear every day that the Japanese threw the dust covers away. Um, I don't buy it whatsoever. Um, it just doesn't like it doesn't make sense with the development. Like if you look at this, they basically had a dust cover on these rifles from um, the early 1900s till the middle of World War Two. And you would think if it was enough of a problem that guys were discarding dust covers, you'd think at some point they would have said, well, especially when developing, you know, the 99. Why are we doing this? We need to come up with a better solution. Yeah, I could yeah. be wrong. I could be wrong with that, but that's just how it makes sense to me. Um, and just the lack I, of photographic evidence, right? Like, if you look at yeah, and if you look at contemporaries, the problem with ninety nines, the problem with ninety nines is that there's just not a lot of because they were made so short amount of time. There's not a lot of the historical pictures of ninety nines in use. Um, there are a ton of thirty eight pictures, and if you look at most of them, you will see they all have dust covers on the right. Yep. Uh, and so I believe more in a couple different, there's a couple different theories about this. I believe rifles that stayed in Japan to the end of the war, you'll notice an early war gun that was taken, like, let's say it's ground. Um, it'll be missing the cleaning rod, the dust cover, the monopod, sometimes the AA sites, not always, but it's usually missing at least the monopod and the dust cover and the cleaning rod. I believe the Japanese took those parts off and use them as scrap as the war went on when they were doing scrap drives. Cause you essentially that leaves you with just a functioning rifle at that point uh, without all the extra stuff on it. And it makes a lot more sense why you'll see like a first series Nagoya that was, you know, ground obviously captured post-war that's just missing everything. It was not U S guys throwing that away. It was the Japanese taking those parts off for the, of the purpose of scrapping them. Um, the other one when it comes to dust covers is I think a lot of U.S. guys did have trouble putting them back on. And actually that, that fourth series I bought at Allentown was really funny because the dust cover was loose on the gun being held in by like the bolt, like the plumb bolt body. The guy couldn't figure out how to put it back on. So it was just like loose on the gun. And I believe that's what happened a lot of times with these dust covers is that because think about how many loose ones you see. And there's obviously some guys breaking rifles down to sell on eBay and stuff. But how many loose dust covers do you come by? Like a pretty good amount where it's like, well, where did they come from? They probably came off a rifle that a guy put into a parts bin and didn't need it at that point. So, and again, this is all the problem with this is it's all speculation just based off what little evidence we have because there is no documentation and you'll hear guys that swear they talk to a Japanese veteran who says that they did that or, you know, the, the, they took those dust covers off. They took the monopod. They didn't like it. I mean, sometimes veteran testimony isn't always the best, especially depending on when you got it. You know, if you're talking to a guy 40 or 50 years down the road, you know, they might not remember exactly what happened. Who's, who's um, heard that FUD lore over and over and over again for 40 exactly. years. So that's my thought on the dust covers. But again, it's all speculation. It's not fact. I can't prove that whatsoever, but it just makes the most sense given Japanese rifle development and how the things that they kept on and continued to use throughout the war. So um, mid war started losing the, some of the extra bits and bobs. Yeah. And then that's and eventually you get, yep. Eventually you get to a rifle like this. Okay. 
So here is your typical late war 99. Um, and when I say late war, honestly, I think it, sometimes it might be earlier than you think. Um, a lot of these changes might have happened in like mid to late 1944, if not even a little earlier than that. Um, but here's where you get the switch to the classic, what collectors call last ditch rifles. Um, that's not a Japanese term. That's something that came through collecting. Uh, guys came up with that name. But this is uh, an 8 Series Nagoya. So you still have the basic Type 99 action. It still has dust cover grooves. It never had a dust cover, 100%. Um, your front band is welded in place. This will not move. Uh, another one that you'll hear a lot of guys say is that they think this one's actually pretty solid. But usually this forend, especially on a lot of late war rifles, will move to the point where guys call it a duffel cut. Um, if you look on Gun Broker any day of the week, you will see late war rifles advertised as a duffel cut that are not. Um, at some point, the Japanese switched to a, a, the three-piece kind of main stock. So you've got, obviously, your split. And then this is its own separate thing being held in by this welded-on front band and your barrel band. Um, and it's 100% correct. It is not duffel cut. Running out of wood. Um, yeah, you've got kind of almost you're back. You're almost back to a Type 38 style where you've got the exposed front barrel and this little tiny handguard right here that goes up to the classic uh, fixed rear sight. Yeah, um, super simplified. It's com very simplified to the. It's it's your sight picture is almost exactly the same as um, an early rifle in in terms of it being like in the battle sight form. Uh, but it's obviously you can't do anything. It's set to, I believe it's 300 meters. It should be is the battle site for these. That recoil um, lug is huge. The recoil lug has also been changed because the quality of the wood is very not good <laughs> to the it's point where we need that. Wood, so you need the extra surface area. Yeah, exact. Yep. hundred percent. So they, they switch to that really large recoil like bolt. Quarter. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a little bit smaller than that, but almost as big. Uh, your front band is no longer, I forgot to mention, they use that kind of style where it's got the cut through it. Um, kind of nice looking. This one is now just a straight big piece. Uh, you can see the well. Yep, you can see the well. They didn't even bother getting rid of that. Um, your bolt body. So you switch to this cylindrical style. Uh and actually, what's kind of interesting is you can have some early rifles, especially in like the 6 Series, for example, where you'll have this style of safe or uh, bolt handle, but you still have the nice intricate bolt or uh, safety. And that's 100% correct. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. So they switched. Yeah, they switched to this pretty early on. So, I mean, this is an 8th Series, and by the 6th Series, they had already started doing this. Um, it does get more crude as the war goes on. So, like, one of the 6 Series is still, like, machined and nice. This one's more cast and not nearly as nice um missing the uh, and then you also, missing the drain that, hole drainage hole as well missing yeah i didn't mention that the the 99s the early ones will have a drain hole right here basically for your your dust cover to let water and stuff come out it would also have one on the bottom these no longer have that at all there's no they had no time for that um your safety is now the welded, well, they're always welded. I know uh, it's kind of a, a misnomenclature there because a lot of guys will say a welded safety, but technically all those safeties are welded. Like the stem of the, the, the uh, safety is actually welded in place. But early on, they did that nice knurling there, and now they switch to this where they don't bother doing anything to it or to do the bare minimum to get that welding um, flush. Uh, you've also got a shorter extractor at this point, too. Um, they switched to one that goes all the way basically to your bolt handle. Now it's about three quarters the way instead. Um, chrome bolt lining lasted longer than you think. You can see the chrome line bolts into like, or uh, chrome line barrels into the, like the seventh series of Nagoya production, for example. So I should say Nagoya made series, uh, zero to 12, um, they made the most of the all type 99. So that's why it's usually the best one to gauge, uh, like different production changes and stuff. Um, 
but yeah, you can still find they actually kept a, a chrome line bolt or a chrome line barrel for quite a while. Um, it'll be difficult to see, but on the receiver, you no longer have the text that designates the model. It's just the mum at this point. Um, and then the other classic you've got from a two screw uh, rear swivel. Now you've just got one. Um, very basic. And then wooden butt plate with three nails, typically. Uh, very simplified design. It does get more simplified as it goes on. Um, so obviously Nagoya made to Series 12, and this is Series 8, and it does change a little bit more um, after that. But this is the kind of model, and these definitely got issued, some of these. So like especially the 8 Series and stuff like that, um, I think a lot of those didn't make it in time to actually be at like, you know, Iwo Jima and, and Okinawa and stuff like that. Um, after that, once you start getting into the really late war stuff, a lot of that didn't make it. But some of this stuff, I think, was made early enough to still be like captured in in battle, essentially. Um, so I could believe like this one when I bought it, it had like a sling on it and everything and it come out of an estate. So this is one that I could believe was like probably taken in battle uh more than likely and then so yeah the the nuance uh of the 99s the is like everything it's just it's wild oh it can, it can get insanely nuts and then once you start looking at some of the other arsenals like i mean there's ones that have like there's some arsenals like Kokura has like a square looking recoil bolt that's really rare. Um, like other arsenals, like Nagoya kept a pretty nice stock for most of production, but Kokura, for example, will have like super chattered where it's like, you know, looks like a beaver chewed it or something right here. Like it, it's super rough. Um, between every arsenal, they all did things a little bit differently. Um, but this is kind of one of the more desirable late war models. So this is what they call a rope hole rifle. So all this stuff is the same. This one actually is kind of loose, so you can actually see that this one has yeah. more of that uh, oh, so that's a duffel three piece cut. stock design. Yep, the duffel cut. What's interesting is you can see here it's got a swivel or the the attachment point for a swivel, but it never had one. This is 100% correct without it. Um. You still got your big recoil bolt. At this point, it's kind of hard to see, but there are literally no dust cover grooves in the receiver. Um, by this point in the war, I think the thought of reusing these receivers later on, like which I think is what the Japanese kind of intended, that's why they kept grooving or uh, machining them with the grooves in there, was that later on they could update these to uh, the more standard 99 production, and obviously that never that happened. Great. After after they won, you know. Yeah. So this one never had any uh, grooves in the receiver, and then you can see right here, there is no. Somebody done on the drilled rear. a hole in your stock. Someone drilled a hole in my stock to make it into a lamp. That's how. I don't think it was this one, but there is a '99 I own, uh, a rope hole that was on YouTube. The guy mm. made a video about it. This, I mean, he was nice, but he was a fud, and. He was going on about somebody drilled a hole. They were going to make a, a lamp out of it. And, uh, you know, it's kind of weird. And I called the store and asked if it was for sale. And they said, yes. <laughs> and uh, I ended up buying that gun off a of, off of YouTube of all places. But yeah, so it's just literally, it's literally just a hole drilled in the stock um, for a rope to be used. And, and, and around here, you would have just tied it around and just wrapped it around there like that. And What's kind of funny is at this point, there are only two nails in the butt plate. They actually made an active decision to stop putting a third one in place because it was saving. You're getting desperate. Many, you're getting you know, desperate. Saving that many nails. You know, yeah. When you're yeah. counting. <laughs> What's that nail? Yeah. When you're counting nails, that means you're in a bad place. A rifle like this probably would have been made like summer of 1945. So probably like June or so. Um, this is an 11th series. The 12th series is one of the most like rare of all type 99s. The last one I saw sell was like four years ago and it sold for like 
almost three thousand dollars. And literally, literally, the only difference between this and a twelfth series is that tiny little kanji mark for what it is. The only difference. I sort of wish I bought it because then I would have a complete Nagoya collection now. But at the same time, I'm like, I I could not justify that at just all. Buy, find find somebody that makes a little stamp for you. There you go. I know that's, that's well. Different. That's the nice. So the nice thing about rope holes because we really got to thank the Japanese. the The hole that's drilled here is slightly higher than where like a single screw swivel would be. Because if it was at the same point, you would see a lot more rope holes exist, I think. If you could just drill right through where like that single swivel style was. Um, so we definitely got to thank the Japanese for that, because there would be so many more of these that existed uh, from just guys faking them. I've seen a couple fake rope holes like that, but the, it's just so obvious because it doesn't line up correctly. But this is a very, in terms of like, Talking about like I know on um, especially on here you guys talk about like rarity like scarcity versus desirability of a rifle. Mm-hmm. This is this is one of those ones that like rope holes aren't super hard to find like it's not like impossible but it's one of those ones that because it's such a uniquely like late war Japanese thing they have such a a, a demand for them just from guys who don't even collect Japanese rifles uh, just because it's such a unique thing for them. Um, so your average rope hole is probably going to be at least like for a nice one like this that's matching, um, probably at least like eight hundred bucks to a thousand bucks for a rope hole. Um, most of them are ground, especially like Nagoya guns. So actually, this is one of the only Nagoya rifles I own that has a ground mum. Um, if I were to find a mummed rope hole, that would be nuts. I've never or a, a mummed Nagoya rope hole have not ever seen one. So. Something to keep in mind if you ever run into that. But this is basically, there's a few other kind of oddball designs. You can get into the Naval Special, which I can show real quick because that's another really weird design. This will probably be our final one, Conrad. Yeah, Yeah. uh, that's all good. What what are we going on right now? uh, We're going on uh, three three and a half. Yeah, oh, boy. All right. <laughs> I made it. Well, just to end it for the, the latest, most odd design you can get, Naval Special 99. Uh, everything on this is cast iron, minus your uh, barrel and your bolt body. Uh, the receiver basically surrounds the entire barrel, which goes like right up to here. And the bolt actually locks into the barrel instead of the receiver. So your receiver basically does nothing except kind of hold everything together. And uh, it, it, it's a very crude design that was made by training rifle companies. Um, and, and some of the arsenals would provide the, the steel parts and they would do everything else. Just so as many companies as they could get could be involved in this kind of like small arms production. Uh, technically, this is safe to shoot. I don't know if I would. Uh, only because the quality of this is pretty terrible overall. Still got the but drain. In hole. theory, I, yeah, this does still have a drain hole, which is funny because <laughs> yeah. they used uh, they used whatever stocks were available. This one still has a cup butt plate, but you'll these but ones no are sling. very interesting because no, it, sling, no sling. The ninety nine naval specials have no attachment point for a sling whatsoever. So I guess you're just expected to carry this. And because it's oh, yeah. basically all cast iron, this thing is like considerably heavier than a regular 99. So I heard the Japanese soldiers didn't use the slings like to sling their rifles. They always had to carry it. The slings were for like other some, something else. I'm not sure about that. I know it's kind of hard. Like original Japanese slings are really tough to come by, like which could be related to that. It's just you don't see most of them you see are like the kind like that rubberized canvas one is still like glued to the gun essentially. But you don't see a lot of Japanese slings. You see more type 38 slings than you do like 99 slings. Those are definitely tough to come by. But something like this is about as late into the war as you can get. There's a few things are like the old 245s and stuff we talked about. But basically the end of World War II is the end of uh, 
Arasaka's as a whole for the most part. At least um, Japanese production. The Chinese did some weird stuff. I have a couple. The Chinese, the Chinese, Chinese did some stuff post war. Um, they used them post war. Obviously, I know you guys are all big into like the the seven or uh, the uh, seven six two conversions and stuff like that. I know there was one they were talking about tonight. Yeah, I have an eight millimeter Mauser um, conversion and a six, yep. seven six two by thirty nine conversion. Yeah. But after World War II, the Type 99 was a dead rifle. And the cart 7.7, dead cartridge to the point where it's, it was super hard to find in the States because when guys were bringing these home, you were not really allowed to bring home like excessive amounts of ammunition. You were not bringing home like, you know, cartons of rounds. You could bring home like 10 rounds as like a souvenir. So even in the post-war environment, it was just, you didn't see it anywhere, which is why you see so many like rechambered type 99s and 38s. Uh, Cause yeah, it was yeah, just way the way Roberts. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That Rob, yep. That Roberts one is a big one. You see all the time. 30 um, the 30 out six. six. Yeah. Yep. Oh, um, yeah. oh, the, but, yeah, the, the United States rechambered a bunch to 30 out six for the Koreans. Yes. And those are actually pretty valuable. Those are pretty valuable pieces because they have, they have very specific markings you have to look for in terms of like the writing of the, the 30 out or uh, 30 Cal on the receiver. Um, but yeah, that kind of ends the history of the Arasaka after, after world war two, basically it was just, a, it was a very short and for the type 99, very short lived design after world war two, basically nobody used it. And in terms of like six, five and seven, seven Japanese after the war, it was just people using it who didn't have a lot of choice, like in China, for example, using up what they had. Uh, you don't see any countries really actively producing a lot of six, five or seven, seven rounds, especially seven, seven rounds after yeah, China and Thailand are the only ones that I can think of that use it after. Yeah. yeah. And even the, even the Thais, they, they converted a lot of their uh, rifles to those different kind of, um, Police the, like where they convert it to look like an M1 carbine, essentially. Yeah, they, they I forget what the model is. Carbine, so. yes, yeah. <laughs> they would even convert those to look like U.S. arms and stuff like that. So, but yeah, that's the end of Arasaka development and how that kind of just ties up. And it's, I think it's like any other collecting group. I, uh, I just jotted down a list of, of um, all the guns we didn't talk about. Like Type 97 Sniper, Type 99 Sniper, Type 38 Cavalry Rifle, the Type 1 Paratrooper, the Type 2 Paratrooper. Uh, like, it's just nuts. The right? Type like we 3 Paratrooper. Hours. All kinds of <laughs> crazy... Didn't one of you guys say there's All a third of... type? Oh, yeah. There's a third... There's, There's a the third type, type 100, which is like yeah, the type I mean, the type 100 were kind of cool because they're literally type 99 taken off the production line, cut in half, like uh, redone to be kind of like a type two, except it uses a different style of inner locking lugs. But it's it's wild how many different models there are. I mean, there's a lot of countries like that, but I think with the Japanese rifles especially. I mean, I own. I was just posting the Discord today. As of today, I own 97 Japanese rifles. And most of them are different. There are some that are kind of duplicates, but most of them are have something different about them to justify like them one, being like one guy. little marking. Yeah, different yeah one little marking or yeah. Yeah. one slightly different. This one has a monopod, this one that's didn't. Pa from that's pattern screen. collecting, man. There you go. Yeah, well, you want to talk about pattern like collecting this instead I, of like this. I don't want to hear it again. I, I don't want to hear you making fun of me <laughs> ever again. <laughs> yeah, it's it can get insanely nuts. And my collection, to be honest, is small compared to a lot of the guys that I know who have been collecting like since the 80s. <laughs> when the stuff was cheap like just to quickly talk about that in terms of prices the prices in arasaka have just gone insane in the last five years i'd say like we're gonna have to an early war an early war 99 with all the parts on it and the matching dust cover is on gun broker easily 1400 dollars these days like at minimum um you can still get mid-war 99s for pretty decent prices but anything and and late war guns, but 
any of that early 99s or like the snipers um like sniper scopes these days are like two thousand dollars like a mum sniper is like four thousand dollars it's nuts so getting into it now is pretty difficult um so i'm kind of glad that i started doing it like four or five years ago before before we cut out can you conrad can you plug your website yeah i do have a website um I actually have to pull it up to get the address because I don't even know what it is. Um, <laughs> Your URL memorized? No, I don't because it's it's goofy. So it's so it's type ninety nine arasakas dot weebly dot com. Um, <laughs> I was gonna say it's a dot monster dot net go or something. <laughs> it, it's some it's some goofy free thing Nat that I Geo. use. I, I used it. I, yeah, I know it pretty much is that one of these days I need to actually just buy the domain. Cause at this point, Google, sometimes I get worried. That this the free, yeah. I get worried that this free thing is going to take it down someday. Uh, but yeah, it's basically, it's got a page where you can look up every manufacturer um, of type 99s. It doesn't cover 38s at all, but it's got every manufacturer type 99s. It's got all the pictures that, I'm kind of known for posting with the wagon wheel, um, oh, yeah. which is a classic thing. I've had a guy actually accuse me of stealing from myself on Reddit once. He said, aren't you that you stole that from the Arasaka website? And I said, well, I run that website, so I don't know if I bought that. <laughs> um, but it's got all the pictures in terms of like proof marks, serial numbers where they should be, different features. So it'll have like, you know, on a seven series rifle, it'll have all the different variations you can find in order of production. So um I'd like to think it's pretty useful. I don't know. I've I, I get pretty decent comments and stuff about it. So I'm sure it's a very handy website. Show. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And it all just started because I realized I had so many, I was like, well, I could probably even do this without asking many people for help. Mm -hmm. Uh I am still missing some variants. So if you ever see something, uh, if you're looking and you see a variant that you have that I don't have, please feel free to message me because I could add that to the site. Nice. Well, thank you so much, uh, Conrad and Michael, for coming on. Uh, you guys yeah. really made the episode because uh, Aaron and I are not Japanese experts by any stretch of the, the imagination so thanks so much for coming on and making this uh making this a good episode i think guys are Absolutely. gonna enjoy this i'm yeah, sorry for rambling for no, three okay. hours sometimes i feel like i do that the, the german one took great. about three hours to to record yeah we so. should uh yeah we should we should have known but yeah, awesome. that's thanks, okay. guys, very much yeah appreciate for, it thanks for coming on all right yeah absolutely all right. once again everybody thank you for coming thank you for listening Join the Patreon for as little as $1 a month. You get access to our Discord. A uh, lot of information there. Lots of good guys there. Uh, you also get the ability to come on the podcast, just like Conrad and Michael. Yeah. Uh, and, we have a waiting list. Uh, and also, uh, subscribe to uh, Millsurp World on YouTube. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, yeah, I hope you're subscribed. <laughs> <laughs> Ring that bell. And smash that like button. Smash that like button. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a good night, guys. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.